It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Alex, Andy, and Jason are here. And hey, good news. Jason Snell actually was in New York yesterday handling the new MacBook Pro. We've got all the information you could possibly want and why it might be a little difficult to choose models. We can explain the differences next on Mac Break Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 893, recorded Halloween, Tuesday, October 31st, 2023. Grayish. This episode of Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Zip Recruiter. Good news! If you're hiring, you've got help. Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter works for you to find great candidates fast. Its smart technology identifies qualified candidates for you, and you can invite your top choices to apply. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash MacBreak. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we get together and talk about the latest news from Apple. And holy cow, there is news from Apple. Alex Lindsay joined me along with uh, Micah Sargent yesterday, last night, for prime time, scary fast, 30 exactly minutes long. So, uh, exactly. Yeah. And then you went off to your after hours crew. And we all talked. Yeah. And I'll be very curious what, what they said. By the way, just talked if about you're the just, fact that they shot it. Go Yo, don't go, don't, 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 don't tip my, my big surprise. Then I'll, then I'll just want to mention it is Halloween. <laughs> so if you're just I tuning in the video job. and saying, I don't, what's going on? Why does Leo look like I, an Oompa Loompa <laughs> Green Bay Packer fan? It's that there time of year, kids. And Alex, you, your, your costume? Uh, my costume is a middling, middling, middle-aged man um, in, in his uh, in his pile of gear that he has accumulated. <laughs> in a uh, I was gonna. I was trying to find my Bane mask. I had a. I have a Bane mask. Oh, that'd and be I was good. Like, I, do the, I do the whole show like oh, Bane. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the things I've learned iPhone? over many years of Halloween is you got to wear a costume, perform in, and then you can sit in all day. <laughs> and this is quite, believe it or not, comfortable. Andy Anako, WGBH in Boston. He is wearing orange. That's good. Yes, I'm. 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 I'm wearing Joker colors at least. Yes. So that's... Nice to see you, Andrew, and Mr. Snell, who uh, uh, is playing Valheim. I like it that yeah. you found a sweater that looks like chainmail. I am. It's just I'm cold, Leo. That's why I'm wearing the sweater. But yes, as Alex said, I am also a middling middle-aged man, full of the stuff that he's collected, but with a Viking helmet on. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, he's welcome. Re he's, re he's resisting more than I. <laughs> <laughs> he's fighting the middle age creep. So, yeah, there were, I thought, really, I mean, everything we uh, heard, the rumors were all true, by the way, except for the things like there's going to be an iPad mini. There were MacBooks and there was an iMac and there's an M3. We're going to get to all the deets on that. But there were two, I thought, surprises that nobody knew about. One, black. Or space black. Now, Jason, you yeah. saw it. How did you see it? I went to New York and got a briefing yesterday morning with Apple. <laughs> Holy and, cow! Uh, got to get my hands on them, and my I got to try to make fingerprints on the on the space black <laughs> oh. and all of that. And and yeah, so I'm, I'm here. Just before I'm ready to report back. <laughs> I got to I got to uh, use this stuff, and I, I, there was ten hours when I knew about it. And nobody else did. But wow. uh, those time that time is over now. <laughs> so you were in between the last week and this week. You were in New York. Wow. That's I, awesome. Like yesterday, I was in Wow, okay. And now I'm back. Boy, my arm's tired. Uh, yeah, it's gray. It's dark gray. Don't, I mean, like I saw a lot of people last night, they were really excited about the fact that they did a laptop in black. It's like, oh man, can you imagine? It's like, yeah, it's well, not what you're thinking of. You may like it. I mean, darker, the darker gray, the better, but it is still a metallic gray. Uh, it's not as dark as the Midnight MacBook Air. So just don't get too excited. Minute, it's and, not as it, dark yeah. as the Midnight Air? No, no, not even close. So the air is the darker of the two? 
by far. Well, yeah. I think I thought initially that this is a very smart move for Apple because you can only get it if you get a, a M3 Pro or Max. So it's kind of like a status symbol, right? Well, you must have a nice MacBook because you've got it in black. But if it's not as but if it's not as black as the midnight I just blue, want, I want to I want I want, I want Apple to come out with and talk about a revolution revolutionary process to embed Vanta Black. Into the, I'm, I'm thinking into Vanta the Black. Aluminum. Why isn't it Vanta amazing. Black? Why isn't it black <laughs> than black? There's He's no black blacker. Why not? Like people, I, I think if they do that, they should at least be good sports and turn off that feature where if something is reported as lost, it becomes useless again. Because that a Vanta Black MacBook is designed yeah, to be it. left behind stealth, and lost. Stealth it should be, it should, it should be like it should be like a like a like an Easter egg hunt for people who say, you know what? I've, before I leave this Starbucks, I'm just going to be looking at the back of every seat just to see if somebody <laughs> forgot a three thousand dollar notebook. Let me quote Jason Snell from SixColors.com. Ooh. I got okay. my greasy monkey paws on a space black laptop and can report that Apple's as good as its word in the sense it seems generally more resistant to fingerprints and other smudges. They said they have a special anodization process on the black. Yes. But I don't want to exaggerate this feature. You can still see fingerprints. They're just not as prominent. Exactly. Yeah. Joanna Stern from the Wall Street Journal and I both were together. We were, we were putting our hands on that thing and trying to get it. Uh, fingerprinty, and That's pretty you know, funny. Apple is, Apple is not making a claim that they are they have created a fingerprint free surface. They're not doing that. I think that people can run away with this, just like with the black, where they're well. Th in that case, they're saying it's black and it's not black. It's just space grayer. Oh, but, I'm so uh, disappointed. But the fingerprint thing, it is better. Like I have a midnight MacBook Air. The fingerprint thing, it, it they absolutely have made this new. The they, they did something chemically in the anodization seal that repels liquid, including oil, from your fingerprints. Nice. So. It's less. It's less. Still fingerprints. It's not gone. Right. It's a little like how they do the thing where it's like, hey, we improved the glare resistance on our screens. Like, there's still glare. There's just less of it. This right. is like the fingerprint re oil repulsion chemistry is better than it's been. But you know, make no mistake, you can leave fingerprints on it and you will. They'll just be less prominent than it's, they were before, which is great. It's fingerprint resistant, not proof. Yes, exactly. More fingerprint resistant than in the past. Yeah. Uh, and and so that's that's nice. But again, and I don't want to shame anybody. If you like a dark gray laptop, go to town. This is a darker gray <laughs> laptop than the last dark gray laptop. I just want to be clear that when Apple says space black, you may be thinking of, oh, the blackness of space. Yeah. I reassure you now, it's just dark gray. Okay, it's yep. not. It's just dark gray. <laughs> Metallic dark gray. That's it. I got. I gotta wonder what the what the limitation is. Like we we've been we've all been watching like manufacturers long enough to know that uh, white is not easy, black is not easy. Whatever thing you, you think is easy to do in the in the trade dress of a of a de, of a device, it's not easy. I wonder if that is they made a conscious decision that they do not want this to be like the cover of a spinal tap album how much blacker could this be the answer is none or if they or if they and, and they that was as black as they could possibly make it consistently so to make sure that the first one is as the same color as the hundred thousandth one or if they decide they, they looked at it in that sort of again blacker than black trade dress and said let's take it back a couple of shades because you can't see the contours of the machine very well and we're very proud of the look of this device so this is not the first black MacBook, but it's the first in some quite some time. When it, was but it? it's it, again, it's not black. It's not black. It's just I just want to be clear. There was a black MacBook <laughs> back in the day. The midnight MacBook Air is pretty close to black, but this thing is not. Yeah, Andy's got one, but this is not that. This it's is this that. is a dark gray. It's a dark hmm. metallic. What gray. is that, Andy? I, it, is that the actual? That's the painted black MacBook. one. Holly. No, no, no. That's no. the that's like the vintage. This was yeah. They painted the it black. Yeah, floor. I remember. I yeah. paid two hundred bucks yeah. extra for that. Yeah, yeah. it's good. I yeah. love that one. But matte black. No this less. Is, that's actually black. This is yeah, not. And it's plastic. That is, yeah, and it's plastic. I think it has something to do with the anodization process that Apple likes to use. That they're using 
anodized aluminum. They're very comfortable with it. They're very good at it. I think they feel actually that part of the their trade dress is metallic, right? Metallic aluminum yeah. laptop is what a MacBook is. And so I think they're not going to go to a different material. And I think maybe below a certain, I don't know whether there's a physical limitation or whether they're just not happy with the results or whether they feel it doesn't feel metallic enough. But like clearly there's, you know, they'll get a little darker. I mean, we you are could talking get about, a, you know. You could get a D-brand skin that's black. Sure, sure, <laughs> exactly. But black. for like Apple's stock, what they want, um, they, they've they gone a little bit darker and they called it black. And and again, I don't think this is a scandal or anything. I just want to be clear. People are going to be disappointed if they think it's black and they yes, order it and they get it. Because what they're going to get is a dark metallic gray. It's darker than space gray. We held a space gray laptop up to the <laughs> space black laptop. And I mean... It's darker. Here's what I'll say about Space Black. In in a well-lit room without context, if there's a laptop sitting on a table, if it's silver or space gray, I think you maybe can't tell the difference. You, you have to see them next to each other. Otherwise, they're pretty close, even though Space Gray is darker. You would not mistake Space Black for those other laptops. It is that much darker, but it's just not black. It's, it's you know, so buyer beware. It's if hysterical, you're though. You're full on you, Darth Vader. You're not going to get it. You have to get a Pro or a Max uh, to get the black. Otherwise, well, that's the story of the day, right? Is that they got rid of the 13 inch MacBook Pro, Pro and replaced it with a 1599 low right. end 14 inch MacBook Pro, which is very exciting and I think a great move. But to get it to 1599, it doesn't do a lot of stuff. Well, wait, right? it has like, eight gigs of RAM to get it to. It has eight gigs of RAM. Eight it's gigs of RAM is like, that's. Yeah, right. It's missing a USB port on the one side because it's using the M3 processor, which has fewer lanes. Uh, it doesn't support two external displays. It, it, you know, it is, but I would argue it has the best feature of being a 14 inch MacBook Pro, which is the screen. That right. ProMotion bright screen is gorgeous. And what it does is, although it's a lesser MacBook Pro, what it's not is that 13 inch MacBook Pro that was from seven years ago and had a touch bar and was completely out of place in the lineup. So now it's a compromised, decontented 1599 MacBook Pro, but it is a true 14-inch beautiful screen MacBook Pro, even though it's got those limitations and, and, and does not and turn space black. It is the end of the line for the touch bar. Touch I was so gone. surprised to see from a number of sources a, a, a lament, a, an ode to the touch bar, like, oh, we really liked it. We didn't admit it, but we really, really liked it. No, no, we, no, did we didn't. <laughs> we did no not one. like it at all. Yeah. <laughs> one guy touch says, was it was a good, one guy said, if good, you're a touch a typist, idea. you kept yeah. hitting it by accident, yeah. but I learned not to. And for people who weren't touch typists, it was great. Well, it's like, come on, yeah. really? It was, is, it was a fine, it was, it was a fine idea. But I mean, if, if it became a idea, if it came away for third party developers to say, by the way, we feel as though uh, as a human interface thing, the idea of putting bespoke function keys that are bespoke for each app directly over the keyboard, which is the one fixed part of the interface. We think that's a flexible thing to do. But from the moment that I started typing on that first demo unit and it started suggesting Suggesting auto correction, like I, I, I type T H, and then now the, the taskbar says, "Oh, do you want to type the there, therefore?" <laughs> like, you're t are you? I mean, I wanted to ask the ask the engineers that I know are very very smart, and I know that there's a lot of discussion. Did you really think I'm going to take my hands off a physical keyboard to I navigate the. towards this tiny little? <laughs> th there, there was never a good reason for this thing to exist. It's it's one of the hallmarks of what I think is probably the worst Mac that Apple ever made. Yeah, it, it is part of a bad era of Apple stuff. Butterfly and I think keyboard that the, and touch the bar. Most tell, yeah, yeah, the most telling thing about it, I think, is like I get the impulse was let's use our multi-touch savvy to build a Mac product that uses multi-touch, but they put it on the keyboard plane where you're really not looking with your eyes ideally. And then the biggest, the truest sign of Apple's organizational dysfunction is when they ship the touch bar the software for the touch bar essentially was never updated. Yeah. The next Mac OS version came out, no changes. They never changed it. So it feels, and when I say dysfunctional, I mean somebody in the hardware group thought this was a good idea. And it's clear that the people who wrote Mac software in Mac OS itself <laughs> did not think it was a good idea and invested no effort in ever making it anything other than what it was at launch. And that is broken, right? Like, why did you make this thing if you were never going to try to improve it? And the answer is, I guess that the people who made it, 
it had a complete disconnect. It, it just it speaks so much about how broken the Mac was in the late 2010s. It, yeah. It's yeah. it's a perfect the, example. The, the, the fact that they didn't they didn't do enough testing to make people realize that uh, even in the, remember in the first generation of these uh, of these uh, Macs. The, the escape key was also part of the touch bar. They'd done away with a mechanical like escape key, not knowing how many people actually rely on that for so many of their tasks that to make that a soft key just makes every single operation that much more painful. I mean, yeah. this, we, if, if, if we did, if we ever got together to do like a special report, I think that we should do like just a show just on that first generation of the, of the, that new MacBook. Cause every single decision, it's the George Costanza MacBook. Every choice they made was wrong. Like, including, Hey, here's the pro MacBook for our pro users. We decided to remove the SD card slot. Well, why did you do that? One word courage. Yeah. No, no, no. I don't think that. I don't think that was. I don't think that was it. But but I remember. Them, I, but I, I remember them, them saying that. Well, we we feel that the pro, the pros aren't using uh, SD uh, memory cards anymore. They're using like Wi-Fi to connect. Like, are you? High? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it, it's actually the same thing as saying, oh, well, you know, nobody needs a physical escape key, as if right. they weren't aware. <laughs> like clearly, there was a talk about your dysfunction and disconnect. They were unaware of like how people used their Macs, apparently, yeah. how pros use their Macs to make these things. They were justifying weird decisions. It was such a broken time. So, you know, and again, I don't want to, I, I think, could the touch bar have been made better and more useful? I think it was never going to be a great thing, but they could have tried. Like, they never even let third parties tie into it, right? They, they, they never did anything. And that is that is the most broken thing of all is that they ship this thing and then abandoned they immediately, immediately. essentially abandoned yeah, yeah. it. I don't get well, it. And, and the, Terrible. The, the, the real issue was the amount of mistypes that you had with it was so frustrating that, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know, that was the thing to fix because I probably would have grown to like certain things on the touch bar, but all I was up against all the time was constantly accidentally hitting something. You know, and, and it was just like, you know, just like, no, 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 that's not what I wanted. Oh, how did I get, why did that just happen? You know, there's a lot of, there was a lot of like, you're not even conscious to it. And your computer would just do something crazy. And you're just like, I don't understand what just happened. And then I realized that all the things I didn't understand were just the touch bar, you yeah. know, and then, and then you just grow to hate it. And that was the... I think that was one so of the issues. So moving on it was, <laughs> to the present. <laughs> there, there's a lot of pent up hate about that. Yeah, we're just really angry. RIP. We're really angry These are, these are people in pain. Julia. Our era, <laughs> the long national nightmare is over, everybody. It is interesting, though, that, that, that all the uh, hollering that Apple should do a touch screen MacBook has seems to have disappeared. It's around. Is it? I mean, I have touch screen laptops using Windows and Linux, and... Honestly, I hardly ever. I don't. I don't think I care. And I, I, I have a bad habit. If I spend too much time on my iPad, then you touch I would the have screen. a tendency to. I yeah. touch the yeah. screen. Like I'm sitting there typing, yeah. and then I touch it, and I go, oh, "I can't do that." Yeah. So yeah, anyway, it's, it's, let's it's, move it's on to good. the present because okay. honestly, <laughs> there's lots to talk about. Um, but goodbye. We hardly knew ye. Touch bar. Really. Um, there is a little hate for an eight gigabyte RAM. Is it? Uh, is there any reason? I mean, I obviously you wanted to get a fifteen ninety nine price point. I added, by the way, uh, sixteen gigs of RAM. Uh, let's go back to five twelve because that's fine. Note: no longer the uh, the two fifty six gig option on the on the on the base model. Uh, right. And they have they were almost at pains to show dual RAM chips so that they don't have that. RAM problem that the uh, that the uh, older ones had. Well, that's good. Yeah. So if it's, I put in 16 gigs, it's 200 bucks. That's 17.99. That's the it's real still price. Not two grand, right? Like the the, the first yeah. thing here is their problem was they can't just say MacBook Pro starts at two thousand right. dollars, and that was why that 13 was with Touch Bar was still around. But now they can say 15.99 for a starting price, and I think they know there are there are probably two buyers that for that low end model. There are the kind who don't care and will buy it with eight gigs of RAM. And you know what? The people who don't care are probably going to be okay. Yeah. And then they're going to be the people who do care and they're going to give Apple a couple hundred more dollars and Apple likes that too. Right. And so that's how they'll do it. But even when you configure it a little bit higher, you're still under two grand. So you're still able to get that screen and get a modern MacBook Pro uh, under $2,000. I expect that Apple is also 
hoping at least, we'll see what happens, that some of the people who are buying that 13-inch MacBook Pro because they just, damn it, it had to be a MacBook Pro, whether it's people <laughs> or corporations, some of them at $1599 will buy the MacBook Pro and then others will look at it and go, well, I could get this nice 15-inch MacBook Air, big screen, uh, a little bit cheaper, and it and and, and it, it's good enough, right? And I think that maybe Apple's expecting they're going to spread those 13-inch MacBook Pro buyers across the 13, 15 Airs and this new 1599 laptop, depending on their price sensitivity. On the other end, if you max out the 16-inch MacBook Pro with an M3 Max, 128 gigs of RAM, and a very expensive 8 terabyte solid state drive you get up to 7200 bucks so that's yeah. the range 1599 to 7199 yeah and at 7199 you're basically putting um, i was i wrote about this when the first M m1 macbook pros came out it's like you're basically putting a mac pro in your backpack at that point right like yeah. and that one of the stories of today that we should talk about at some point in this show is how they're differentiating the three chips because it looks like they put their foot on the gas of the max chip whereas the pro chip is sort of been turned into a mid-range chip which is really interesting but they know that there are if you listen to their language last night it was very much like for the most demanding users and i really believe that's where they're headed with that max chip is you know really like the name says max it out make it as performant as possible because the people are and it's super expensive but it's also super powerful and so the people who really really want the very best and that mac pro performance in their backpack that's they're going to spend seven grand on a laptop and they're going to be happy about it but i suspect most macbook pro buyers will be buying the m3 pro instead and this i don't know if that drive is as fast as i don't know if the drive is as fast as it is in the studio but if it's five gigs then you want to put as much I, mean, I used to be like oh i'll never get more than a terabyte of 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 hard drive space and i i really screwed up when i bought my studio that way because i just didn't realize how fast that internal drive is and so if you're out there capturing you know, raw, you know, raw 6K or 8K footage or 4K footage, and you want to edit six or seven of those, um, you know, layers together, uh, you do need that drive speed and you do need that power. And if you're doing it in the on the road, if you're a creator doing it on the road, you will need that that speed and the $7,200 will not be a big deal, um, you know, to, to do that. So it, it is, it's great that it will scale up to that. Uh, I do say, you know, like my, my, my wife, does not need more than eight eight gigs of RAM. <laughs> like she just doesn't do enough to. You well, know, she probably doesn't need a MacBook Pro. She probably needs an Air anyway, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, but if you want that, an M2 based MacBook Air is fine. XDR screen, right? Like, oh, that the would be, screen, I, I yeah. really believe yeah. that the screen is the number well, one feature on those laptops. So yeah. if you're like, I don't really need more than eight gigs of RAM, but I want a beautiful 14 inch XDR yeah. screen for my video watching and all that. Like, yeah, fifteen ninety nine, well, it's there. And, and also the U number of USB C connections is more on the Pro, and that's a that can add up, I believe. Mm. I, I, isn't it the same? No, on the on the low end, on that M3 Pro, because it's the M3 chip, it is limited by, so no support for two external displays, right? Because it's got the one right, built-in display, it'll only drive one. And the the um, that extra USB port on the left side of the computer is not there on that low oh, end system. Oh, it's for not some reason there. I thought it used to have all also, the pros used also to have a memory bandwidth on both sides. But all the pros lower. Yeah. So you're going to yeah, so, this is a yeah. if you are uh, specking out a new MacBook, you you actually really are going to want to pay attention because right. they've actually given up some performance in some regards. Right. So the low end the low end SKUs that have this this M3 are missing that port and, and because it's an M3, right? And and it's just like on the 13-inch MacBook Pro and on the MacBook Airs where the M1 and M2 are, have the same limitations. So, uh, so the M3 will drive one external display. The M3 uh, Pro will drive two. The M3 Max will drive, I think, four. Uh, Up like to 6K. It, it is, I mean, really, a is, lot yeah, of performance. Yeah. So it really it really scales. But you're right, Leo. One of the one of the quirks, like the M3 Pro chip has fewer performance cores than the M2 Pro chip did. Yeah. They actually, it's it's six performance cores and, and really performance scales with performance cores. So they're, they're giving back performance and then getting it back just 
in the M3 being more efficient, but like they are clearly kind of like repositioning that chip as this mid-range chip for that. Honestly, most pros don't need more, more power than that. So they're okay with it, but you are losing that. And then as you pointed out, the memory bandwidth is actually less than on the M2 pro, because again, the M the pro used to feel like it was the max's little buddy. And it, it doesn't feel like that anymore. The max is like going into the stratosphere and it's going to be much more expensive, but into the stratosphere. And the pro is kind of like inching back toward the M3 as a mid range uh, chip. So they're really, it's the first time we've really seen this kind of differentiation. From and this Apple is probably what chips. it's going to be going forward. They've decided to make a stronger so. differentiation between pro and max. Uh, well, I think they know, right? They know that the bulk of their pro users don't need all those features of the Max, but they know that their high-end users do. And what do you do in that case? And the answer is you got to differentiate, right? Because that, right. that high-end chip's super expensive. But some people are like, seven grand for a laptop? I don't care. Give me the Max performance. I think that's the <laughs> Alex Lindsay. Uh, so, right? <laughs> but but the pro, like most, a lot of a lot of people that are kind of in the mid-range, like they want more than the M3, but they don't need a Max, right? So they're they're trying to make that something that is more affordable or has the right margins for Apple that they can make in in bulk and that the bulk of the MacBook Pros are going to go with that one. So I think that's why they're doing it this way so that they can please your general purpose pro-ish user who wants to spend three grand, two grand on a laptop and still please the people who are going to buy that M3 Max and let's not forget in the seven thousand dollar laptop, but they're also going to buy it in the Mac Studio. They're going to buy it in the as an Ultra in the Mac Pro. Well, an Ultra like would be really just two go. Maxes glued together. It's two Maxes. Yeah, yeah. So, and I also thought it was interesting at the very beginning of the event they showed a video and they took great pains to show the different kinds of users. And I think this is also an adjustment to the marketing. Uh, because it used to be, well, there's pro users, but now pro users could be software development, photo editing, STEM, graphic design. They even had medical imaging. You know, they had some very interesting yes. categories. Yes. And it's, yeah, in, I and noticed by the way, too. gaming is one of the categories now. We'll talk about that in a bit. Yeah, I know they they seem to be I, I you watch enough Apple marketing, right, Leo, and you and you you start to pick up on, oh, they've got some new categories here. Yeah. And I feel like and they also use the phrase for the most uh, you know, the users who demand the, the most, most demanding right? Like I users, feel like they're yeah. they're trying to create those spaces where they can say this is why the Max exist. And the the Max M3 Max, not Max, M3 Max exists versus the M3 Pro. Uh, to, to sort of differentiate them. So they're definitely trying to sort of like set the stage for we've got our super demanding high-end users and then we've got people who just want this amazing performance, which is that pro chip. And then we've got the suckers like Leo who just say, well, I'm going to buy the fastest thing because I, for bragging rights. <laughs> Seven grand, please. And because it's black. <laughs> Ish. 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 <laughs> Benchmark tests prove that M3 is one larger than M2. Did you get to it. do, you didn't get to do any hands-on uh besides the fingerprint you didn't yeah i mean how much it was limited yeah, yeah. To fingerprints okay <laughs> <laughs> so we don't we'll have to wait for benchmarks and so forth apple had its usual right next week oddball graphs uh that were actually pretty hard to interpret in fact they, they no. we were a little confused uh, during the event <laughs> anthony nielsen was trying to figure out well what a, if i go back and forth it's very weird um, when what, you're looking at the processors. Think, it's such we, a bad thing that Apple is getting famous for having graphs that you just have to just say, that's very, very pretty. We're putting that on the fridge. It's such a pretty graph and not really tells us nothing that, that it's going to tell us anything or exactly. Well, suspicious. what's funny is last week, Qualcomm in their best new event there, you know, we're better than M2 event. Has <laughs> almost identical graphs. Like this is now going to be the standard. In well, and it's interesting that Apple, Apple has gotten <laughs> everyone to play in their branch. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I think that, <laughs> I think it's going to be interesting because Qualcomm got to do that for a week, as we said. One of the things that, that. Yeah, uh, by the way, you know, it was very funny because Qualcomm compared everything to the M2. And it was right. almost as if Apple said, hold my beer. <laughs> and then just said, yeah. no, that's, <laughs> that's, like, that's like, old. Awesome. We don't. Do yeah. yeah. Well, and and one of the things uh, we talked about in office hours after the show, after the show we had there was that we were talking about who is the target market. And really, I think a lot of times the target market is not M the people who just bought M2s. The target market is the M1 owners. And most importantly, there's still a lot of Intel owners out there 
that are, you know, like, yes. when should I jump in? And and so when when those graphs that say 11 times 11 as fast as your in times Intel. faster. Holy. So 11, 11 hours more battery life, too. I love and, that. That It's yeah. very clear that there are lots of people out there still on Intel. And we as tech nerds are like, oh, Intel, that's old news. And like, I know it, those numbers make Apple <laughs> look good. But the truth is, lots of people, I know, I have lots of friends who still have Intel MacBook Pros. They still have Intel iMacs. Well, especially a iMacs. Four, five, six yeah. year cycle. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I and I have I have a stack of Mac Minis and a Mac Studio, but my my work my road computer, which I don't do very often, is still an Intel. <laughs> like this is the last Intel that came out. I bought it. I haven't it right before COVID, and so I haven't been able to uh, justify buying another computer. But when they say 11x, I start going, mm. yeah, <laughs> like maybe I should start thinking about. Let me it. But let I me know, take a little break that that's uh, a to market. keep us on uh, target time wise, and then I do want to talk about. Uh, a new uh, idea that they introduced, this memory caching thing. And I want to understand what yeah. they're talking about, yeah. what that means. Um, we uh, we are breaking it down the day after gotcha. Scary Fast. <laughs> I can't say that I talked to somebody at Apple who explained to me how that caching thing works. But if you had... You are going to tell well, us. I could what try you to would, explain it to you. you would, uh, I can't, I, but still, <laughs> even, even, to, even despite that benefit, try to speculate on what yes, you imagine such I, a thing yes. would, would I, go, I coming can't up. say that I, I talked to Andy Carluccio about it, and I mostly understand it. Oh, yes. Andy, who we love because he's <laughs> yeah, the Zoom yeah, ISO so. guy who really helped yeah, us yeah, set yeah. up Zoom ISO, uh, yeah, so is, is ideas, make, writes his but, software for Sil Apple Silicon. So yeah. here's and a Jason's probably closer attention. to the truth. So we'll listen to Jason first. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and then you can clean it up for me. That'll, that'll work. <laughs> first, a word from our sponsor, HID Global. HID Global lets you reduce risk, operating costs, and complexity by outsourcing public key infrastructure operations to HID Global's cloud-based PKI as a service model. It provides automated management of the complete certificate lifecycle and encryption. It's your one-stop shop for simplifying private and public key PKI management with one predictable price on one easy-to-use platform. Their simple subscription plan has no additional charges for additional certificates under your current plan. Geographically dispersed and scalable architecture across multiple regions, HID Global goes wherever AWS is. Ease your procurement pains with HID Global. You'll get up and running in two weeks, which is much quicker than the competitors. Their assistance with deployment always includes their incomparable white glove service, expertise, and knowledge. Plus, you receive your complete ownership of private keys. For Google and Mac systems, HID's connector model of PKI uses open source certificate utilities so your organization can use multiple operating systems. That's great for BYOD. Visit hid.link slash MacBreak today. I hope to God they're only listening. That's all I can say. <laughs> I, I don't know if I have the most credible mean at this point with my giant Packers hat. Uh, all right. So if there are very, uh, by the way, I said there were two surprises and we're going to get to the second surprise, which was at the very end, they said, oh, by the way, the whole thing was shot on an iPhone. And uh, we have some stills from the uh, press release video that Apple put out. And I think Alex and I uh, and you guys will go through it one by one to see how they shot this on iPhone. But before that, that very one of the very first th things they talked about was memory caching. Now, this is what I took away from it. And I'm sure, Jason, you can uh, disabuse me of everything I know. What I took away from it is, uh, act, you know, as a developer, you know this, you will allocate memory as you write your program or the compiler will based on how much memory it's going to need. And that's kind of written in stone, but it's wasteful because until you actually need that memory, if ever, uh, that memory is allocated and is not available to any other process. Apple says, oh, you know what? You don't have to worry, developers. Keep doing what you're doing. But in hardware, we are going to pay attention. And if there's available memory, at least temporarily, we're going to allow other 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 uh, processes to use it. And we'll give it back to you when you absolutely have to have it. That's kind of what I got from Apple's presentation. How close to the facts is that, Jason? Yeah, that's, that's about right. It, the idea here with dynamic caching is... Uh, the impression I get is that this was Apple looking at ways to make their GPUs more efficient and that they were um, 
supremely motivated to dig in and find other ways. So like the GPU performance that you get in the M3 is not just better because the GPUs are better, faster in general, but one of the ways that they were able to increase performance is using this dynamic caching method. So that that's one of the ways they're able to eke out even greater GPU performance and this, trying to be as efficient as possible. This is not an operating system level uh, uh, feature. This is in the hardware, right? This yeah, is it's chip, M3 chip only. Level, chip level M3 okay. only. And, okay. and what it's doing is, like you said, uh, at compile, you can choose uh, if you're working on a GPU, and I know this is really technical, but it's super simplified, believe me, uh, is you can choose like how much memory does each thread have in, in terms of the registers, literal registers of memory. How much memory does each thread get? And you set it up. And uh, your choices are to sort of like, what's the peak I'm going to need? And then you set up a peak and you take all that memory because you know that sometimes you'll need all of it, but other times you won't. And then in other cases, you allocate a small amount and you think, I'll try to fill it. But, you know, that's one of those places where if it fills, you got to you got to delay action. It's like a bottleneck. You got to delay action until you can clear some of it and then reclaim it. And what Apple is trying to do here without any recompiling, there's nothing the software needs to do is Apple is watching the memory being used by threads and dynamically um, allocating and deallocating based on what's needed. So what they were looking at, and you saw that in their little animation, is if you're reserving for the peak, there are every trough is just waste of memory and if and again, if it's the only thread it doesn't matter but if you've got dozens of threads on the gpu in a really intensive activity and a bunch of them are reserved for this peak use but aren't in the they're in the trough you are wasting memory bandwidth that could be going to something else and so the system is going to look and say you don't need that right now and some other thread can get access to that memory and then when you need it you get it back and likewise, if it looks like there's a bottleneck, it will increase the amount of memory allocated to that thread so it can get out of the bottleneck. So this whole system is basically, it's a, it's a really different way of dealing with memory on the GPU. It's transparent to the software. It's optimized to, to make the memory as efficient as possible. And Apple says, I, I'd be interested, experts in GPUs will probably find other approaches that are similar to this from other companies, but you know, at least the people at Apple that I talked to said this is a thing that Apple basically did that is not has not really been done before because they were so motivated to improve the GPU efficiency. So this Alex, is how they did it. Do any other GPUs do this? Is this a this no? Is, no, this no, is it's, new. It's 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 because it's it's. it's so one of the things that that's happening here, and, and what we're not sure of is whether we're really talking about RAM or whether we're talking about the cache. So the the important thing is they keep right. on saying cache, and it's important. Well, the quote that's was allocate word. the use of local memory in real time. Right, but it's but they keep on talking about you know this this dynamic caching, and right. why that's important is that there's a lot of memory, there's gigabytes of memory that's available right. of, of RAM that's available, but the amount of L2 cache is now like I think in the new M3 is like 16 megs, you know, like it's or 16 gigs or something. It's it's a no, it's it's huge. Megs. Sorry, it's huge. No, no, 16 megs. No, no. Oh, it's megs tiny. is tiny. Tiny. It's tiny. It's like this little amount of of data there. So these caches are are very small and. Um, you know, and so then using things like like you know branch prediction and speculative ex execution, what you can do is say, look at look at how it's using that cache because that's what you're using up really quickly. If something says I need 12 megs, it may only need 12 megs once in the entire time you run the show. Right. But but it but it says I if for this operation, and it's not just multiple things. It may have a bunch of things that all need when they're all stacked together. They need 36 megs of of um of RAM. Of, of cash, not RAM, cash. They need 36 megs of cash, but they don't need it all at one time. <laughs> right. like this one needs it now and this one's needing it. Right. So looking at those branches and looking at how it's using it, what it can do is start to figure out, well, they don't need that. And the worst case scenario is that, oh, I we miscalculated because it did something unpredictable and it throws it out to RAM, um, which is slower. Um, than than what's there, but but what it can do so, is actually. Um, so it's really you think, think they're mod they're doing it with cash, not with. We think RAM. that the, what they're what they're trying it's to handle. The, it's in the thing. name, right? Right. So exactly. it's dynamic cash. But, so, the, but yeah, but caching is a technique. Well, the, yeah, but, but but what we think though though that 
that the it's as well not as a the thing. Ram, it's, it's a noun it's not and the a ram. Verb. That's the problem. It's the, yeah. the fact that the cash is so small, but the cash is way faster than the ram. So the thing is, is that the, the cash is super fast if you can keep it there. And, and to remember to go back in the history lesson, we talked about this a little bit, I think yesterday and, and before, but there was a, the problem in Motorola was that the G3s and the G4s was that the G3 simply was going to double the cash that was on the, the G3 was going to double its cash. Right. And the G4 guys, the 604 guys didn't pay attention to that at all. And suddenly you ended up with laptops that were twice as fast as the, right. as the, the uh, than, than the towers. And the reason for that was because of this cash. But the problem is because the cash is, you know, screaming fast because it's right on that GPU. So the, um, so the thing is, is that the, uh, so I think that what they're doing there is they're saying, well, I know that you need 36 megs, but you only need this much at one time. And, right. we're gonna, and as you run it, we're going to figure out how to, you know, as you run it, we're going right. to watch what you're doing. And then we're going to get spec, have this, you know, speculative execution where we're going to start getting ready for you to do this thing and saying, you only need this much so I can put, be pack these other things in. It doesn't mean it's going to crash or anything else, but what it's going to do is dump it back out to RAM when you run out of cash. It but just be slower. Can be yeah. But, it's be, but it can be much more aggressive about what it keeps on that cache, which potentially, now for operations with tons and tons of texture maps and tons and tons of geometry, it probably isn't going to make any difference. But for things that sit inside of that cache, it could make it, I mean, much, much faster. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like, I don't know exactly how so, much, but like two, three times yeah, for To you confirm know, what you're faster. saying, I'm looking at the pros on Apple's webpage. And I think you're right because it says dynamic caching optimizes fast on chip memory, on so chip memory, RAM is, is not on chip. Too. RAM is a separate chip. Oh, it's, in it's in package, but not on in chip. In package, but not on chip. They're using LDD, LD, LPDDR5 chips. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying optimizes fast on chip memory, it is the it's the on chip cache, which is right. tiny. Which yeah. is that's why you have to get aggressive. Like when you have all that RAM, you, at first when they said it, I was like, I don't understand why. Uh, why bother? Know, why that would be that big of a deal? Yeah. But when you're talking about a tiny little cache, more sense. being able to squeeze squeeze more out of it, it would make a big deal. Well, It'd and and you can. I mean, what I said in my story was that they were extremely motivated to do this, right? And that's yeah. the impression that I get is that they were like, how, what, what are what are the inefficiencies down at this cache level that we haven't addressed that are just that that are sitting there and this is what they found right which is exactly what alex described the idea that you've got threads that are just gluttonous because there's a moment when they need that much and the rest of the time they don't and so so apple's basically saying yeah 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 yeah. tell us what you want and you'll get it when you need it but when you don't need it you don't get it and as a result more stuff can be in the fast cache right next to the processor and that means that everything runs faster. And and according to Apple, this is one of the reasons that graphics performance on this chip is so much better is because it's like getting a bigger cache, essentially, mm -hmm. and, a, a, and a far more efficient cache. Why not why, put in I a mean, bigger cache? It's expensive. cost. It's yeah. real fast you stuff. You have 96 billion transistors in the max. Seems like yeah, you might still, have enough I mean, to put in. I, I, I mean, I know I look like an idiot, but... Well, in this case, they didn't have to, right? right? Like in this case, they did some very clever this is in improvements lieu of. Yeah. that meant that they're using it more efficiently, which is uh kind of kind of clever. And that you know, it's that dynamic cache like is a marketing name for a very complex concept, but like they're just trying to explain and their and show some pride and show their technical prowess that they did this. But that was their goal. And you know, as we've talked about Apple Silicon all this time, it's very clear that efficiency is like a huge thing for them they're so obsessed with being more performance efficient and optimizing watt. yeah right right they they're not as concerned they they're they obviously concerned about performance but they also really care about efficiency and performance for bot and things like that and i think that efficiency drive is what motivates them to build a feature like this instead of just slapping in more l2 and calling it a day well, also yeah. that's a weak spot in apple silicon they don't support discrete gpus so it all the burden for GPU performance is on Apple entirely. Uh, they and just as yeah. they did with the iPhone 15, they now have ray tracing, and they have what is this? What is this mesh thing they're talking it's, about? It's it's another thing that is. Uh, it's another. I mean, Alex probably knows exactly what it is, but it's like these two things are techniques that are used. They're both in that iPhone Pro chip as well. This isn't yeah. new to this. It was in the iPhone Pro chip too. But it's you know you put it in the process. The iPhone and now Pro chip is essentially an M3, right? 
It's a little tiny M3. Yeah. yeah. It's a it's a different node, but it's With less a, stuff. It's essentially, essentially an M3. So uh, it and, yeah, and initially you think well ray tracing and mesh. This is for gaming. Mesh shading. Uh, but it's also for what any kind of graphics. AR. 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 Oh, AR. Yeah, I mean, uh, AR. Yeah. So oh, the AR. So the you know the AR could is is definitely something that could that could that'll benefit from the both of those things. You know. Yeah. So right now, for instance, we're limited. Uh, if you send something to somebody, uh, you're limited to about two million polygons and about fifty megs for the file. So if I if I send you if I text you a US USDZ file, um, and it's more than fifty megs or more than uh, you know I, th I think two million polygons, it will say ah, I can't can't do that even though it, it but now it should be able to create you know increase that um and the efficiency of that render if you start sending heavy models back and forth um it's going to be more efficient that mesh the mesh rendering um could be pretty interesting i don't know enough about it yet because it's brand new <laughs> so so i don't know with the mesh rendering but the um but the it it feels like when when they showed an example and they kind of brushed past it it doesn't feel like it's exactly like nanites but it feels like it's in the same family you know i'm going to figure out a, a way to render you know, a lot of this junk. Nanites is an geometry. Unreal Engine feature, right? Yeah, it's something Epic has in Unreal, and yeah. and so which is super powerful. Like it is a like Nanites is game changing for you know um, showing large environments and so on and so forth. And so and it does bring up a question that came up in office hours a couple of times, which was, uh, do we really think that the the Vision Pro is going to come out with an M2? Like they showed it with an M2, the demo units are on M2, but it feels like if you're going to release this and then wait another two or three no years kidding. before you release the next one, it feels like the M. What may be happening is that the that the we, we may see an M3 in there. We may see increased frame, you know, uh, resolution and and uh, frame rates and stuff like that may come in because there's been there's been a little bit of confusion because you know Apple is uh, you know they they're saying 90 frames, but there's folks that are getting requests for more. <laughs> so, so it's, so I think that there's, I think that that's going to be, uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what happens there. Yeah. And also Apple, Apple has a track record of <clears throat> uh, taking all these high performance graphics operatives and not simply putting them in places where you'd expect uh, a high performance graphics mode to be relevant. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you were going to, this is sort of thing is going to start to power like 4k 60 frame per second. I message video chat, not necessarily next month, but maybe next year. Uh, and it's, it's something that I think that has been a lot of on a lot of our minds when, you have uh, this really, really very, very different mode of video chat that happens on the Vision Pro. Would Apple really benefit if that, those modes were only available for ones for chats that happen between two users of the same $3,000 like high performance VR AR headset? Whereas, would you like to basically make sure that the person that you're talking to who's in an office, who's looking at a screen, who has a, a halfway decent video uh, conferencing camera, maybe they can get the benefits of that as well. So they can also get 4K 60 frame per second because it's not necessarily transferring, uh, 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 encoding and transferring a video at that frame rate. It's actually creating a model that it then uh, transacts between these two parties. So we're going to see this pop up in a lot of different places, I think. And just also to be clear about dynamic caching, because there seems to be some confusion in our Discord. This isn't why you have 8 gig max, 8 gigs of RAM. This has nothing to do with RAM. Nothing to do with it. It's no. all about GPU performance. It has nothing to do with RAM. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm. A, I'm a little, the the one place I'm. I'm really confused. Well, the one place I'm really confused about this is they, is basically the idea of okay. The the one of the biggest eye popping numbers that they put out last night during a half hour presentation was 21 hour potential battery life, and we know 22. That that's okay. And it, 22, oh, sorry, 22 on the 16 inch. Uh, yeah. And, and 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 we all know that okay. That's under really really good conditions, but Apple usually has a way of saying no, no no we can actually demonstrate we can actually back this up we're not simply saying that here's the here's which moon of jupiter you need to be operating on for this battery life to happen let and me I'm read the uh, footnote on that because it's fairly long testing conducted by apple september and october 2023 using pre-production 16 inch macbook pro systems with apple m3 pro pro yes yeah, zoom in will you because it's fine print 12 core cpu 18 core gpu 36 gigs of ram and 512 gigs SSD. The wireless web test measures battery life by wirelessly browsing 25 popular websites with the display, display brightness set to eight clicks from bottom. The Apple TV app movie playback test measures battery life by playing back HD 1080p content with display brightness set eight clicks from the bottom. 
So 22 hours yeah. of that. But yeah, so so and well, and, and look also, closely. Uh, it's fine nice. print. I know. Yes. And part of it is now that now they have a new AV one uh, and decoder built in on chips. That's got to have a factor. But but they're also talking about how uh, this new caching system is also contributing to that uh, that performance. So I'm trying to figure out like what circumstances are we going to get the best benefit from that performance is it really going to be hey i'm rendering out a really really big project file or is it going to be like the typical situation that i have here where i have uh, i have a dozen apps open uh, each doing a little tiny separate thing i've got a, a browser yeah, with several windows and several tabs right. in it right it's so, watching it's apple not, tv I'm, I'm not, at yeah. 1080p eight clicks below eight clicks above the, <laughs> the darkest for 22 hours and the web browsing's 15 hours. And by the way, that's also on the 16-inch because there's more battery. Well, the challenge with this, right, is that performance is what you do with it. And so, yeah, you could kill the battery real fast with some stuff and other stuff will right. go forever. And what I think Apple is fairly do, uh, realistic with their estimates, yeah, like, unlike yeah, a lot of is, the other PC manufacturers. <clears throat> I know this is inside baseball, but like we back in the day, we had a Macworld lab and some of those people work in performance marketing at Apple now. Right. Like and they are building <laughs> it very much like they did at Macworld back in the day. They are building repeatable tests right. that can be compared across generations. And that. That is so battery claims are what you make of them. But I think the important thing here is when Apple says wireless web, you compare last generation to this generation and the numbers, the, the tasks are the same. So the numbers are comparable. And that's the important thing, right? Because again, is anybody going to really get 22 hours? Uh, probably not. But you know that that's that is possible with this use case, and that if you compare it to the last generation 14 inch, they only said 18 hours, and so exactly we're efficient there. And that's that's all right, it's in the eye of the beholder because you could I could kill this thing in five hours. It's like, yes, you can, <laughs> well, if you know what to do, you can kill it in five hours. But well, you know, I, every use case is different. To, a, be, to a, be fair, let's look uses. at the battery life because the Mac Pro, uh, or the Mac. Uh, the M3 Pro or the M3 Max is 18 hours in the 14-inch, just as it was before. However, the 14-inch M3 is 22 hours. So that is, that is. Uh, I want to correct myself, it's not just the 16-inch. So uh, the M3 is, is a little bit more efficient as well than the sure. Pro and the Max, yeah. as you would expect. Uh, yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to the next week of analysis on exactly what this new thread performance uh, with this new caching system actually has and whether what are they all of the knock-on effects because it seems to me as though this is not just simply hey look fire performance in a b and c it's like oh and we also didn't figure out that when you're doing uh when you're when you're uh when you're doing like uh data transfers to like a remote nas uh, remote nas to to to, to uh, when you're doing high speed late latent uh, uh cloud computing setups how fast can you get this data in and out through the networking bus and through the CPU? So, hey, wow, because it, it turns out that there's so many micro trans transactions that are happening there. That's actually increasing performance of the networking by at least 8%. That would be interesting to find out as well. Uh, that, well, I mean, ask though. I mean, it's, it's GPU performance. Does the GPU get involved in that kind of thing? I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm I mean, sorry. traditionally, not on, a, not on a PC. It's CPU bound. Right, right. So no, but there's, a, there's a whole, I mean, Apple calls out what they want to call out, but Andy's right. The sense that um, M3 is lots of different things, right? It's not the M2. They do lots of little tweaks in there yeah. that affect performance in different ways in different places in the system. And when they claim like CPU or GPU or, or, or neural engine or something like the AV1 codec, right? Which is a little thing, but it means that if you're downloading AV1 from YouTube or Netflix, it's not being decoded in software anymore. And that saves huge on battery. Like the little tweaks here and there, we won't know until we've got our hands on it, how that affects, you know, anybody's individual use case. Cause it will be different, right? Like every one of these chips has its own little personality here and there that the Apple has built in like little, well, cause and, that's the secret, and, right? Is software means you can do anything. You can program it to be anything you want, but the stuff that is very common, they try to put in the hardware so that it's well, way and, more efficient. And this is where, you know, again, Apple is in its own little world now, which is that they have um, their own IDE, they have their own operating system, they have their own hardware, they have their own, you know, they have all of these things all tied together and the ability to kind of take full advantage of the hardware, take full advantage, you know, and of efficiencies and so on and so forth is much more in their wheelhouse. It's not that other companies can't do it. 
it's just a lot harder. I mean, it is I, it is a lot harder for a consortium to figure this out and, and agree on everything at the speed that Apple's doing it at. I think that's the real, they're taking advantage of the, of the what is oftentimes a disadvantage of them being the only ones that do this. It is an advantage if you integrate all those things together. I think Apple's made it very difficult, though, for the end user to figure out what they're getting. Look at this as Apple's, you know, let's get more detailed. And this confused the hell out of us yesterday on the processors. And if you click these different tabs, they're not even comparing the same things. It's all over the place. And so, I mean, I think a consumer is going to say, oh, it's 3.7 times faster. That's all I need to know. Well, it's 3.7 times faster than a 13-inch MacBook Pro with an i7. Well, and I think that that calls towards them constantly wanting to, they're really, the growth of their sales are against people who still have Intel machines that they're trying oh, to Andy, have they them. just, I mean, Alex, they're just picking the best they numbers. Say, they're not. No, 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 but I'm, but I'm saying that, 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 but I think that they're, they're, specifically pinpointing what you're seeing is that comparison to a uh to the intel machines because people like me are impacted by going oh, 11 times faster than my laptop you know and and it's maybe it's not a perfect one-to-one -one, but the point is is that i think that 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 is really what apple is is focusing on is how do we get all these intel folks that are still there that's a big there's a big pot of gold there is a bunch of intel users that how do you move them to the m series and it's less about the M1s and the M2s and more about getting there's that's just the easiest place to dig to that's the, the easiest place to dig for gold is where there's a lot of intel folks and the and the math is starting to get pretty overwhelming. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Leo, yes. One of the reasons is it's a big number and they like that. They just want I, they just I, want you to see the purple number. That's all they want you to just, see. It's not just <laughs> it's not just and the reason is that although we tech nerds like to th believe that everybody buys a new computer every year or two, I get the distinct impression from talking to people at Apple that there is an enormous set of MacBook Pro users and iMac users who are still on Intel and they haven't moved and they're not in the Apple Silicon world and they are trying with this marketing and it is marketing and they are selling something, which is a new computer. They are trying to get them all out, right? Like get out of Intel. It is because the truth is, yes, it's like night and day now from an old, even the best Intel iMac, even the best Intel MacBook Pro is not close to what the Apple Silicon one is. And it's clear, like Apple knows better than any of us do on the outside what their buying cycles are like. And I think that they realize that they still got a lot of people to market to who are on Intel and they're trying to get them to come over to Apple Silicon. Whereas people with M1s and M2s are much less likely to move because those are all, because let's face it, even an M1 is a pretty great processor, even now. Mm. So, but Intel, that's a ripe opportunity for them to get people who are on a four-year or five-year cycle who've got a, a 2016 iMac that they're still sitting on, a 2018 MacBook Pro to get them off of it. So it's both. It is marketing. It is a big number. They like that. But I called them on it yesterday. I was like, come on, Intel. And, you know, I, I, I'm not supposed to quote them, but I will just say I got the strong impression that there are still a lot of Mac users on Intel yeah, and I'm they not, want to get I'm up. not debating that, but I think that these slides are really designed, you know, here's, uh, here's photo editing. And uh, if you really break it down, they're comparing it to a 13-inch MacBook Pro with i7. Yeah. The M1 is, the 14-inch M1 is, is twice as fast already. They yes. don't put that number there. Because then it's 2.7 times for an M2 Pro and 2.9 times, you know, which is 10% faster. Well, they're not than, selling that. They're not selling that I understand, anymore. But, I understand. But, but you, and you but, say this in your article, too. And I think this is important for uh, people who are paying close attention, people who listen to the show, for instance. What is the bump from an M2 to an M3? It's, you say, about yeah. 10 to 15. We won't know until we get one. But we don't know. But 10 yeah. to 15%. It's not... It's ten percent in the phone, um, and yeah. I think yeah. maybe some of us, uh, <clears throat> me anyway, uh, and I know I don't look like the sharpest tool in the shed <laughs> right now, but I thought that the three nanometer node would show maybe just by and by itself because it's a three nanometer node, better than ten percent performance improvement over even oh, an M two. Yeah, we we don't know, and they they know. reshuffled the cores, and they've re reshuffled all of this. I would say what's really telling about this marketing is they're not comparing it to today's Intel because they're not yeah. interested. Absolutely. They're really not. They're comparing it to old Intel Macs because they're trying to market to people who still have their well, old Intel. And Mac. it is a good number. I mean, eleven times faster than yeah. the iMac Intel Did iMac resist? is pretty good. And by the way, Lisa Hard. was using an Intel iMac until about a month ago when she bought an M1 yeah. iMac. 
Uh, and truthfully, if you you shouldn't feel bad if you've got an M1, because yeah, the M3 is 11 times faster, but the M1's probably 10 times faster. Mm. That's a so, huge update. <laughs> so, but, I do, but I do, but but I do think I get what you're what you're trying what you're saying here. That like <clears throat> it, it, it it does feel a little bit by comparing it with like uh, Intel based Macs, it feels a little bit like Apple is comparing a jet fighter to to a, to a, to a 1962 to Chevy. It's like, it's not, re, it's not relevant. I'm not sure if it's a, an effective marketing message because I think anybody who who owns an Intel based MacBook, there it's, it's probably three, four, five years old at this point. They know that a Mac that's, that's five years newer is probably going to be substantially better in a great many ways. Um, and it's, it's going to be a little bit of a twist in the next year or two when they really can't do that anymore. And they have to basically compare themselves to the, themselves we got a guy in the irc named tellingly power mac 8500 <laughs> who says the intel <laughs> systems are just fine and people don't want to be forced into the new os versions that make everything vastly different and even m1 even breaks some software that people use mr well, fancy know. pants flexing that he doesn't have a 68000 processor power mac That's 8500 some of, some of us are more efficient than you sir this yeah. is yeah. this is a slide though this is a slide that everybody will look at and go and gasp, the uh, this is MacBook Pro 14-inch 3D rendering in Redshift, 49 times faster than an i7 in, an, in a MacBook Pro. That's yeah, a sure. big number. That's a and, lot. That's a big number. And by the way, more than twice as fast on the M3 Max than the M2 Max. So that's yeah, an that's interesting probably their number. Best that's probably their best test. So you got to show yeah. the best test. But, but yeah, I, I, I think the interesting thing here, and and Andy touched on it, is these are people who haven't gotten the Apple Silicon Buzz. I mean, they know that they've got an old laptop, but it, you can see Apple here being like, hey, 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 <laughs> come on, come on, get off right. of Intel now already, right? Like it's time, get get going. I, well, I think it serves those two purposes pretty well, sure. right? It's a great number. You gotta love 49x, Jeez and Louise. they know that they've got those people that haven't made the plunge yet. And now we're in the third generation of these chips, and they're like, make the move already, okay? Well, and get over here. And definitely making sure that they know what that number is, what that multiplier is. I think using that number as a, um, you know, as this constant reference, because there's still millions and millions and millions and millions of people that are still sitting on Intel chips. I am. I have computers that are still sitting on Intel chips. I have a, most of my computers are. Now, some version of an M series, but I still have, I don't know, half the computers that we have at 090 are still Intel. And so, um, so we're still, you know, when you start looking at those numbers, you're like, oh, I got to get rid of those computers. There is, you know, I like mean, in, there, in, so. the, the top line performance bumps are pretty good too. 80, this is from uh, the front page on apple.com 80% faster CPU, multi threaded performance than a 16 inch MacBook Pro with an M1 Max. So, you know, that's a, that's a lot well, faster. Well, the Max. See, that's what I was saying about the Macs being the place where they're putting the pedal to the metal. Yeah. It's like, that's where you're going to see the real performance boost is that they increase the core count, uh, CPU core count, performance cores. They increase the GPU core count. That Max chip is really fast. And that that's the number that I noticed was the most impressive to me was how much faster the M3 Max is than the M3, M1 Max that's in my Mac Studio. It's a lot faster. <laughs> yeah, that's like, what's that's in my where, Mac Studio. And that's part of that differentiation yeah. that they're doing where they're trying to say like, look, if you want it dramatically faster, we put that in the Max because that's where it matters. And the other ones, they're kind of like managing it for price and for, it, they're a little bit faster. They could make them faster, but that would make them more expensive and they're not trying to do that. I, I you know, so that's, that's where you really see at the high end is where you'll see the ultimate sort of like judgment of this generation of chip is how much faster is that fast chip, even though that doesn't really affect you if you're just an M3 buyer or an M3 Pro buyer. 80%. Uh, faster and 80% more expensive, I might, I might add. Uh, the M3 14-inch base model is $17.99. The uh, M3 Max 14-inch base model is $31.99. Uh, now, admittedly, there's some other benefits uh, to that, like 36 gigs oh, of memory. Of but still, uh, th th yeah, so you're paying a lot if you want a Max, and you know who you are. Right. I mean, again, you, you do the math around time, like how much time, what yeah. is your time worth and what are you doing with it? And if it's something that you're sitting there watching, I mean, I, we were talking again about this earlier today, we were 
When I was at uh, ILM, I wrote a three page paper about why 64 more megs of RAM would, this is how much you're paying me per, to watch my screen. Right. And this is how, when it'll pay off, it'll pay off in like four months. And then every four months after that, it keeps paying itself off. And so as a, when you're talking about that kind of performance, it should be either someone who just has a um, stupid amount of money that's just buying things because they can. Um, but for the most part, the people who are buying these maxes are doing that calculation. Like how much do I get paid? How much time do I lose, you know, not having it ready to go? And, and even just a little bit like that redshift test that 49 times faster, that is a big deal when you're sitting there going, <laughs> how does my, I got to render one frame to figure out whether my lighting's okay. Yeah. I have to render a couple things to see, you know, whether this is colliding correctly or this particle system is doing what it's supposed to do. And me sitting there for 50 minutes instead of one minute is a big deal. Like, you know, and, and, and so those are the kind of things. And because again, the people who are using Redshift and looking at that, you know, the, you, they're the people who never will finish their project. They'll just run out of time. Right. Like the, the project will be as good as they, they had, time to execute against. And so time really is money at that point. Do you think that uh, the, the people who are buying these MacBooks uh, will get the information they need, will be able to make the decision based on the information Apple's provided on their, uh, in their store and on their web I, I think, I think mostly you look at it and go, wow, it's a lot faster. Yeah. Like, you know, like, and it's, and again, if, if I think if you have an M2, you're going to, you know, like someone's on a cadence and they'll go, you know, th this is the opera. Usually what happens is you have to keep releasing these and you have to keep on showing those numbers because all of us have been conditioned to wait to buy something until the, until the new release. Right. Like you're always, now's when you, go, now's when you make that cal you, calculation. Yeah. You, 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 you let it go out. I mean, the perfect time in my opinion is about two months after the release, because the, the, if there's any idiosyncrasies, if they don't change the, the model and all they're changing is the chip, then you can do it right afterwards. If they change, the, if they change some stuff and they made it look different, you, you're like, eh, maybe I'll let it go a month or two right. of them like quirky. Cause there've been a couple of times when Apple's released, not released a new version, but obviously some, some parts of the manufacturing got better after the first month or two. Um, so, uh, so, you know, if it's a new form factor, then I tend to wait a little bit. If it's not a new form factor, then you can buy it immediately. And that's when you're getting the biggest bang for your buck, theoretically. Um, you know, and then, then you wait until the next upgrade shows enough improvement that you've decided that it's time to buy another one. And usually that's for most professionals, it's, for that are for max buyers that are actually using this for heart for work every two or three years <laughs> like you know it's every two or three years you're going to go yeah you don't really have to it. think about that you just wait every few years and then but you're waiting the for that release out. and you're waiting for those yeah. magic graphs and you're saying okay now is the time to buy the new computer yeah. so uh yeah. one thing that was interesting this is the first time apple with it, apple silicon has released all three base model pro and max at the same time in the past they've kind of stretched that I, out. I I still am going to keep on saying this. It's weird to have M3s on the base models and not have M3s on the Pro and the Studio. Like, it's just, it's weird. I get the, well, they will. Know, the Studio and the Pro. They will. I mean, I know, we know I, now what they'll they, be, too. We don't even, at right. that point, it's this chip with form factor differences. But they're going to release it in June or something or right. March, and it's just weird to have six months of of... I have a computer that is theoretically slower than a laptop, you know, and it, and I get that it's a small percentage. <laughs> I know of my Max, my, my Max Studio is now much slower. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. So the thing is, is that it's like it's. I, I just think that Apple is going to have to eventually sync these up. I know that they're they're different, can't. but I they just can't. can't. Apple is not capable of revving every single Mac at once. They're just not because they're of the to. way the way that they have their their design team structured and their engineering team mm -hmm. structured and the factories structured, they cannot turn every single Mac model over I, at once. They have to stretch it out. And so they stretch it out over a year. I guess I feel like the year. Pro should come first. <laughs> like, like the Pro should be, I always feel like the Pro well, the, the pro version should be the, the high performance, the highest well, performance. The most important Pro product the, is I know it's the, it's the MacBook Pro and yeah. it got it this time, which I think is better, right? I well, think it's and the Ultra than what still it used is to, to be, come. which is new generation for the low end only. This is yeah. not. We didn't get that. There'll be Mac yeah. Studio and Mac Pro with Ultra with the M3 yeah, Ultra. next year, sometime. Yeah, yeah. It just I know feels, Alex wants it now, but like, no, no, it's I, just I, it, it just feels weird, it feels weird to be sitting on top of a Mac that that you know is is like the laptop is faster than my the computer that I spent X amount of dollars on. You know, it just I, I feel like it. Yeah. Not a great user experience. That's also all. there may be an issue with availability, chip availability, right? I mean, I suspect that's a big but, reason. But even if there was, well. 
you would still go, well, I want to do ultra. Like, I feel like the low volume is the pro ones. And I feel like the pro, I, anyway, I just feel like the pro ones eventually have to be, here's the M4 and they're on the, on the pro ones. And the other M4s will come later when we can make more of them. You know, that kind yeah. of thing. You, re you remind me of, I always crack up when I see on Reddit, people with like, the finder should really look like this. Here's my redesign. Like Apple's going to pay any attention at all. No, I just, <laughs> I know that they're not paying attention. I'm just saying that it's. it's I know what you want. I know what you want. No, it's, it's, no I just feel like I, I don't really care. I mean, my, my studio is as fast as I need it to be. The, here's the reality is that I don't do the kind of work I used to do. Yeah, mine is too. I can, yeah. I can, I have time. I have a, I have a studio max and I'm quite fat. I'm quite happy with it. It's the best computer I've, I've right. used. You know, I use it all right. day, every day. I'm very happy with it. So I'm, it's not that big a deal to me. I just feel like when I talk to other pros, what comes up all the time is when well, a laptop just came out with a, you know, that's faster than my, than the computer I just spent an incredible amount of money on. And I feel like that it just kind of, it's not, Apple's usually pretty good at the surprise and delight. And that, I, so it's not so much what I want. It's just mostly that I think that people feel a little, you know, there's a little tweaking there that that happens that is not a usual Apple experience, yeah. which is, you know, where's our usually studio? if you where's our Mac well, usually Pro? if you're if you're global services, you you expect to get on first, right? <laughs> you right. Know, like you know, that, that, I think that's the deal. Are you it's happy about the Apple. hardware rendering? The they've added AV1 decoding. What is AV1? Well, AV1 is a is that's the next generation of um, of what we're doing for compressed audio. I mean, video. So you know, instead of HEVC. You know, a lot of is Apple sourcing. TV using AV1? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's using it. Uh, it I'm will not sure be, if it's using I guess. it yet. Right. Yeah, but it's and and again, most of the processor is capable of AV1 right now. You can uh, a I Mac see. a Mac can can do it, but it's now using up some of its processing time. Right. And it's more battery intensive for right. it to yep. use the GPU and CPU. So having a chip that's dedicated to it means that if you're watching AV1, which is going to roll out on YouTube and roll out on Netflix and roll out on Apple TV and everything else, you're going to, it's going to take less battery um, to, to watch it. So when you're watching that stream on your laptop, on your lap, sitting somewhere in your living room, it'll last longer. Um, the also Zoom, you know, and other things will probably support AV1 over time. And so you'll start getting AV1 streams. And, you know, these will either be lower bandwidth with the same quality or the same bandwidth with higher quality, you know, because AV1 is about 50% better than, than HVC and roughly 30 to 50% better. 30% so, better compression ratio, according to Gumlet, uh, and 43.9% right. better uh, resolution. Right. Um, so, so, big improvement. So you'll either, either and, you make it, and for, for companies like Netflix, um, it's either cheaper to stream. This right. is, AV1 is really important to the streamers because you're not you're no longer buying a video and then watching it. So when when you pay fifteen dollars or twenty nine dollars or whatever you're paying to buy a video from on from, you're streaming from the it. You don't app store, own. you don't download well, it. Yeah. But 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 the point is you did pay something up front to watch it. And so then the the one dollar it takes to, or, or not one dollar, but the twenty cents that it takes to send it to you is not a big deal. And they can make it high compress, you know, really high quality and everything right. else. But when you're paying 10 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month and you're downloading, watching hours and hours and hours and hours of content, does that actually pay off? And so getting that bandwidth to be less expensive at the same quality is super important. Like you can see it, like for instance, Netflix doesn't do, I don't think Netflix does a very good job of this. They keep their bandwidth really low so that they can um, save money. Sure. But then they, they're, you know, you watch Gray Man, like watch some of the bar scenes in Gray Man. It's like Macro Block City, right. you know, and it's because they've, they've cheaped out on it because they can't afford for you to be downloading, you know, a 20 meg stream. So they're trying to give it to you in four. Right. You know, and there's another advantage, complex, which AV, is that AV1 gives you the advantage. HEVC has a licensing fee and AV1 is unencumbered, right? It's royalty that's free. A, that's the big deal. I mean, that's, it's more, it's not only more efficient, but it's more like, so H266 or whatever that they're working on is going to have another licensing fee. It's going to be more efficient than H265, but it's going to have licensing and nobody wants to pay that license anymore. The business has gotten too big. MPEG lost the thread <laughs> like they people have been frustrated i mean the delay of rollout of h264 and then h265 has all been about money you know and and youtube does not want to pay that money and neither does facebook and neither does you know like lots of things and so and neither any of the streamers and so it's it's really been um the only 
company really willing to pay it has been Apple because it allows them to differentiate their their product and they can afford it. The negative on AV1 is it takes about three times longer to encode than well, three, HEV. No, no, not three times PC. longer, three times more um, processor CPU, right. more processor. So it's very, because, you you know, when you want to compress it really, um, when you want to get that ex extra quality, you need more you need more processor time. It's still coming out real time, or it's coming out at whatever speed it's coming out at. Um, but it's it is um, but it's the processor time. Do you and wish they had an like, AV one encoder in the uh, new chips? Well, you wish they. I, we, you know, I wish I had a pony too. But I, you know, like it's you know, like it's but it's you know the, it, the question is how many people are actually generating that. I think eventually having an AV one encoder makes a difference when you, companies like uh, Zoom have. If, when they start to do AV1 for encode and in decode real time. on both ends, yeah. that becomes really important because that means that you're using a lot less. That means your laptop will last a lot longer through right. Zoom meeting, so on and so forth. Um, so that makes a difference. But for most people aren't streaming. So having that AV1 um, capability is not as important. Um, but you have to remember that, like, for instance, the the stuff you see on Apple TV, like when you buy a video um, or even when you get it from Disney Plus or whatever, then the amount of time it takes to encode that is two or three days. Yeah. Like it is, you know, it's it's not multipass. It's like but multi, they only multi, do it multi once. Pass. I they mean, this, is, this, well, is, this makes sense. It, you, know, they, you do it once do it and then you play and, it back a million times. Well, they do it a hundred sometimes. Like because they're, okay. they're the number of the number of times they have to build it out is right. is way different. But right. the point is, is that it is there is like it's not just real time encoding and all these aren't made equal and AV1 is going to make a huge difference, but eventually we need to see encoders. I bet you in by 2025, we'll have dedicated AV1 encoders on the computers as well as decoders. But right now all you need is really decoders because you're watching streaming and that's what they're Andy Carluccio is in our discord. He says that Zoom is in fact rolling out AV1. They've joined the I didn't, Alliance for Open Media. So <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't, didn't know what I could say. <laughs> yes. Well, he has said it, so it's okay now. I can repeat it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's actually a press release. Uh, so okay, uh, it's it's public knowledge now. So thank you, Andy, for giving us the uh, the insight. Um, he says this is he says he's excited for what this will do for Zoom ISO, decoding out AV1 yeah. to production systems. We'll get the benefit of that uh, here. Yeah. And I guess no, we're going to have to buy, John, a bunch of uh, M3 Max, uh, Mac Minis when they come out. <laughs> God, that's some very happy people behind the camera there, <laughs> jumping up and down. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, I want to take another break. Uh, we have lots more to talk about. Um, it was a big night. They got a lot done in 30 minutes. It's taken us an hour and 15 to kind of even begin to parse it, but we will continue in just a moment. Our show today brought to you by Wix. Oh, you know Wix. And web agencies, you're going to love this one. Let me tell you about Wix Studio, the platform that gives agencies total creative freedom to deliver complex client sites while still smashing deadlines. How? Well, first, let's talk about the advanced design capabilities. With Wix Studio, you can build unique layouts with a revolutionary grid experience and watch as elements scale proportionally. By default, no-code animation. Those add sparks of delight. Custom CSS gives you total design control, but and it doesn't stop there. You can bring ambitious client projects to life in any industry with a fully integrated suite of business solutions from e-com to events to bookings and more. And extend the capabilities even further with hundreds of APIs and integrations. You know what else? The workflows just make sense. There's the built-in AI tools, the centralized workspace, the on-canvas collaboration, the reuse of assets across sites, the seamless client handover. And that's not all, but you need to find out more at wix.com slash studio. Thank you, Wix, for supporting Mac Break Weekly. One of the surprises came at the very end. <laughs> Apple said, we shot this whole thing on iPhone. That's a nice flex. They actually have released now. It's in the, the we put out a press release with a video of uh, behind the scenes. And we have some stills from behind the scenes. And I was hoping, Alex, you can explain uh, what they're doing. First of all, yeah, yeah. Uh, big old uh, jib there and a dolly. That's not a jib. Oh, that's not. That's a crane. <laughs> 
that's a technocrane. That is a much more expensive <laughs> version of a jib. Like jib, you know, uh, jib, jib, a jib uh, like uh, of that size is, you know, like a $20,000 arm. You know, it's not yeah. a big deal. A technocrane, that's like a quarter million, half million dollar technocrane. Like that is a expensive, very expensive technical uh, arm. It's really cool. That's all I'm saying. And it looks like it might extend out to be even as high as Apple, the Apple campus it probably building. doesn't go that far but it's probably a, <laughs> it, it could probably expand expand out to 40 feet at least um, wow. 40 to 50 feet and it's it's a um uh and what you saw by the way to go back to the the jib there so or the, the and then there's brand, a dolly there's on the left right well also notice the teleprompter that so the the iphone is in a teleprompter <laughs> that he's reading <laughs> You know, there. Right. And then you have these big, I, those are probably airy <laughs> sources um, that are there. So there so is a, the, and they the didn't show it, those, uh, but those, another part of the video shows there's a big softbox above him too that's yeah. not in the shot right now. And so then, they shot this what, almost day for night. I mean, they did, it looks like they did shoot at night, but, the, and, but and, there's a lot of light and then they made it well, darker. I would guess, and then the and then there's a there's some other stuff there that the, on the last one there that is, and that's a softbox with you know an egg crate on it. So that's kind of directional lighting. Um, what we saw on the last image there was a uh, there's also hidden there is a Teradek Ranger that's sitting over it like a little. Oh, and they made a big deal about that. that yes, now that you can record yeah, so, via the USB C port to an external drive. We well, can, a, well, that's a that's a most likely it is going out HDMI out of that phone. And then it's going, it's getting transmitted to the uh, Teradek. Look, look. So that you can see the Teradek <laughs> Ranger. You can see the antennas. It might be a bolt, but it's a bolt that has that's a so has a thing on. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a lot of gear mm. that's that's in there. Can I, so, can, do you think that that kind of the, the, this kind of behind the scenes kind of undermines like what they were saying at the ver that very, very, it was, it was a fun, it was a fun flex. I think all of us expected, oh, of course, it wasn't just some dude holding the iPhone with maybe like a $10 LED, but it's like, look at this. What the hell is this it gimbal like, that it's on? Yeah. Yeah. So that, so what that is, is that's a, <laughs> that remote head. I'm not sure the brand of that head, um, but it, but what it does is it allows you to change on the X, Y, and Z axis. So you can yeah. roll. So, so that's a rolling. And this um, is the shot where head. they pan through the room uh, and there's a guy playing a bass and a woman on the floor with her MacBook. And so I right. think and, that's and, why they wanted all these axes, right? So they can kind of right. well, zoom through that exactly. room. And, and so that, and it also lets you level it as you turn. And then we think that that is a, um, that the, the case is made by Beast Grip. So in the <laughs> last behind the scenes that they showed, they were using a uh, small rig. That's the the Rodrigo video that they have made by the phone. Yeah. So it feels like they're kind of they're either it's the filmmaker that makes the decision or it is a um, or they're spreading the wealth a little bit. But they showed a small rig on the last one, but a Beast Grip on this one. And Beast Grips are Beast Grips are really nice. You know, they brought in a third party uh, to shoot this. Uh, and the director is Brian Oakes, who's apparently a well-known documentarian. He did Jim, the James Foley story, and Living with Lincoln. Uh, and they brought in a, a third party to record it. There's Brian. He's with Radical Media. But that's mm -hmm. that's typical, right, for uh, Apple? They oh, yeah. don't. They don't yeah. use their own yeah. in-house. Everybody does. Yeah. I mean, and they and you know this because you're Apple. one of the companies that people hire. Uh, yeah. Apple... Um, uh, they have a lot of their own in-house capacity for some of their commercials. They definitely, because it allows them to keep it secret um, and keep it safe. Right. <laughs> so anyway, but. Uh, <laughs> oh, I recognize that. that. Anyways, so, I recognize right. that uh, AJ, AJA box on there. We have a few of those. That's So yeah, that's an HDMI decoder, right? Or no? Right. So it's it's most likely there. That is a. Um, HDMI to SDI, maybe? It could be, or fiber. It, they could be converting HDMI. See, I can't quite make out if you go, it's that looks like blurry. a high five. Yeah. Um, it could be, it could be fiber as well. So they could be converting from HDMI to SDI and then SDI to fiber so they can see it somewhere else. I can't quite. Yeah. Make cause they had a AJA. bunch of taps, not just that tap on the camera, yeah. but uh, for yeah, the what producers, you do is you, they had big screen taps. So. Right. They have to be able to see it somewhere. And so that's what they would probably do is send out there's because now you have the USB-C to HDMI. So you do USB-C <laughs> to HDMI and then you're, um, then you're able, and here's the crazy thing is you can go USB-C to a breakout so that you get, you get the HDMI out of it, but you also get, you go to the drive so you can record to the drive. And, and I thought it, it what's amazing is to get the full quality out of the, out of the phone now, like when you turn your phone all the way up now, it goes, Hey, you need an external drive to even like you to go 4k 60, you need an external drive 
connected, it's required on the phone to get that frame rate. So it's a really, um, yeah, it's interesting. So anyway, Apple's it's, it's, John Carr, a pro workflow spe video specialist who worked on Top Gun Maverick and Terminator Dark Fate, and Jeff Wozniak, I wonder if he's related, uh, who, who worked on Transformers, Avatar, and Iron Man 2, consulted. It must have been fun to work on that team to get all of this attention. Um, they they apparently use the Black Magic camera app and yeah, Tentacle yeah, the Black Sync. Yeah, yeah. The, so the the tentacle sync is the getting the time code in. So it's it's being able to add the time code to the system, um, so that you can sync all those bits and pieces up. The the There's black the hard magic drives. camera. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, right now the black magic camera app is the state of the art as far as how do you squeeze the most out of the phone. You have all the controls. That's what we're seeing there, right there. Is, yeah. yeah. So the one thing that I have to admit, even I looked at and was like, what the what? Like everything was kind of <laughs> like. So this is um, this actually looks like. It, um, so the fact that he was using the, so they were using the follow focus here. That's the, that's what you see that, that wheel is a follow focus and he's turning it. If you, if you just kind of go through that a little bit, he's turning it and it's changing These the focus. Stills. We don't have, we, we okay, can't play yeah, the video. So, Apple will take us oh, down. Right. So anyway, when you watch that in the behind the scenes, he's turning that and it's changing the focus on the phone. So he's using a follow focus on the phone and even for even for you know, and I think I think what's happening there is that the Black Magic app may be actually able to see the Black Magic follow focus because there's a Black Magic piece of hardware. I can't quite make out that control, but that was the one moment. The rest of this was all like, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I understand, I understand. And then when they showed the follow focus, I was like, what the what? Like what what is going on there? And so they're actually doing that. The follow that's a major flex in my opinion, um, and that does look like. <laughs> I mean, this like is that. so subtle. None of none of us noticed that, but of course, somebody who's doing I mean, the rest deep of it was like you're putting a camera. Yeah. Like the rest of it, I was kind of like you're putting a camera on a jib. I mean, yeah. on a technocrane, and sure. you've got a head, and you've got a yeah. thing, and those are all things we know. The idea that you Using could the um, focus. use the follow focus on the phone was like wow. really like whoa. Wow. You know, like I was that kind of blew me blew me away. The other flex was they shot this uh, at night and it's dark and yeah. typically a I phone actually, is not good in low light. I wondered whether the whole reason they shot it at night was specifically to show off um to show off the yeah. fact that they're show, they're able to shoot in the dark. Yeah. You know, I think that How the black level Although dark, yeah. again, I suspect I mean this shot you you can see it's much lighter. I suspect they kind of shot day for night for a lot of this that you know, you you shoot it much brighter. They were using. <laughs> there, I don't know. It's Long so dark. Light. I don't even know what I'm seeing here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they. So I don't know how bright it was. We will. We will never know. They could easily have shot it with a full bright and then just dimmed it. Right. I mean, you want to get as much light as possible. No, to I, that I mean, I think that they were. Oh, and by the way, the um, I did finally uh identify that that is the 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 head that they're using the big one with the rotating head there yeah is a is an m7 ebo uh, or EB, oh, wow. yeah, ebo that's made by chapman um and, and that's the that that head there i i finally saw like a little thing on it i was like oh i know what that is that's <laughs> chapman. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> chapman um so anyway so so mv mv7 ebo is what they're using there the um uh i think that they a lot of it they were showing off that they could shoot now they again the subjects were lit extremely well you saw yeah let's show some more images we have films. we we, yeah. we stilled a bunch of images out of it look at all that light that is a lot of light that's not yeah. dark that's, 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 that's yeah. more light that's than i have in this studio right now yeah but that's why that's why i wanted to ask you alex is this is this mostly a demonstration of prores rather than the hardware basically saying that under the ideal circumstances it can dump it can dump video to an external device that is yeah, this professional quality. I mean, it's not, it doesn't well, the seem sensor like too, the demonstration though. of the it lenses. Says, well, it says something yeah. about the sensor and lenses. Well, it, <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll agree with Andy to some degree that, that, that basically what you're showing there is that, but what they really are flexing is you can use this for production. And now will you make the next, will Christopher Nolan take this on? No, Probably not. No. You know, like he's not. So, but, it is for, I mean, I think that there is a huge market for Apple to really own, and they do own right now the creator market when it comes to people, you know, shooting a lot of these things. And so, I mean, Apple's number one competitor right now is Sony, right? Like the Sony cameras. And so when it comes to creators, and so the the thing is, is them showing how far they can 
uh, push this and the fact that you can shoot log and the and there's a lot of cameras out there for creators that you can't shoot log on you know and so they the also mentioned you, aces you uh in the press release uh saying they're they the only a smartphone lot. to support the academy color encoding and system. that's a not a minor thing and it takes an enormous amount of work to become you know to to get into that aces um you know system and so uh that's for that color they, right yeah and here you can see that that's the black magic app that's there that's you know um and the interesting thing about the black magic app is it really runs a lot like the black magic camera so you're really not for someone who's using black magic already it's not a huge um I like you know, the, change in hope. i like the thunderbolt 4 cable they're showing attached to that yes, just, exactly. <laughs> i mean it's uh, with a little l i think that's a little uh l converter there for that Thanks but and to i think uh, that, anthony by nielsen way, who took all of these stills out knowing we could not show the video uh we were able to do this uh there's a nice little dolly shot yeah and that's a chapman i think a chapman dolly which yeah. is a really you know high quality dolly um there, what, what i think that there's there from an aspirational Oaks, perspective, by the way, the director, right? And then, then this is your full. And this is a DaVinci Resolve, which, by the way, a lot of Final Cut folks noticed that the, they said edited on a Mac. They did not say edited in Final Cut, um, and that was. I think this is very interesting. Apple is so. giving equal pride of place to Premiere and DaVinci. Uh, as yeah, as, Apple, it's like yeah. they're saying, "Okay, use whatever you want. We don't care anymore." Well, there's a lot of love for third. <laughs> I think Apple needs to spread it out a little bit, and I think that. You know, the there's a lot of resolve love here. There's also some Cinema 4D stuff that we saw. What you is, know, is the, he using an iPad shows. to control that? What is going on there? Uh, that's a that's a Mac. Is it a MacBook? MacBook, okay. MacBook Pro. It looks black. Uh, it's a MacBook Pro. Yeah. Um, it must be the it might new be the black one. one. Must yeah. be the dark gray one or whatever. Yeah. But and I don't know how much you would actually. I mean, it's a great photo. Um, I don't think that they would actually do any work with the last one that you saw with all the controllers. <laughs> that's more what you this would is, use when you were hey, putting this together. Come in and than, sit than down. <laughs> yeah, he's looking. He, he's like, for the reference, <laughs> for reference, I'm going to look here and see where that thing is on my actual thing that's over there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 See, again, that, yeah. that's just what that's just what bothers me about this. I, I don't. I'm not saying it's not impressive, but I'm saying that look at all of the other stuff they added to that $1,200 camera well, to make the, the, this, what, this is why I, I think it's more, it's more impressive to say that here's the output that this thing can generate that even that under the best can, that it, uh, if, if that the, uh, this is what it's capable of, you will not have the resources to do a shoot of this level. However, you know that the limitations of the video that this thing can record for your project, be it a, a creator content thing or whether you're actually just using, even using this as a B camera on like an shoot this is the best that you can get and the best is not limited by what you'll be able to do with this camera right the idea here is that you could throw all this money at it but still have an iphone at the center of it and it'll look great and now you don't have that money but it does like the iphone's not going to be your problem i think it's right, kind of exactly. the message here right it is now as capable as i mean i know it's not as capable as some other hardware but it's like it's basically as capable as you want it because we even used it it's a great it's great marketing right because in the end nobody's I mean, a very small well, number of people are going to use it for this, but it does send the message to other people that if you buy a, an iPhone Pro, like, yeah, that camera is that good. And it yeah, makes like, you feel well, like, like, the, like the message, like, I feel as though the message is not to people who are considering buying like an $18,000 red camera. It's to people who are, I think what Alex alluded to earlier, people who are considering buying a $2,200 Sony, Sony Alpha. Well, and it also means that you're, you end up with a lot of film people buying iPhone 15 Maxes because they know that they can do pickup shots with it. Like they're like, like, well, I can, you know, I can intercut this with other things if I if I wanted to. Yeah. I mean, we have to remember that the creator, which um, that uh, that came out, was all shot on an FX3. Like that's a like, you know, and the and the reason that that uh, Gareth Edwards did that was he said, you know, you could put it on an R, you know, a, a handheld like a, you know, an R2 or an R3, you know, DJI, um, and so these are you know, being able to shoot lightweight, you can see how people might use this for some of the scenes, you know, because they can go Does to places still, like for in the In, the, in my, my day, phone, it used to matter that you would want to use the same make uh, of camera for all of the shots because it's very hard yeah. to match otherwise. Does that matter anymore thanks to Aces? Well, the Aces, the Aces is a big piece of getting those all in the same in the same ballpark okay they're still all going to have slightly different now intercutting between two cameras in the same scene complicated yeah but it's not unusual to change camera systems when you are going to a different scene yeah if you went from um, a tight you know, shot of tim cook to a drone shot it's okay if those are or, different cameras or, or by the or way i want to before we go too much farther correct myself that was not brian oaks that was stefan sonnenfield who is the ceo of company three and i'm presuming company three was the 
yeah uh they production company sonnenfield <laughs> is that any any relationship to the, the other director Barry? brian sonnenfield Barry, yeah. no, i don't know okay. actually um the uh but you know like we, we see baby? things intercut <laughs> it, you know you know what the funny thing about nepo baby maybe is that 100 years ago everyone was a nepo baby yeah that's right they were doing. like yeah. you were doing whatever your parents did yeah. so anyway so the so anyway but the um uh the the thing that that you know when you see that it does change the flavor you can get close like if you watch the matrix the fight scene that's in the you know i know kung fu kind of fight scene they're jumping from high speed cameras to regular cameras and you can totally see you the flavor see the, changes yeah, yeah. you can change the flavor of the blacks and everything yeah. else and so those things happen all the time in filmmaking but the um but i think you can see how you might be able to do some pickups and more importantly it is showing creators which is a much larger piece of that pyramid hey, you can shoot something really high. You're only limited by the hardware you're willing to put around it, but you can shoot, you can keep scaling with this product um, up to something that is, uh, you know, pretty amazing. So it's, I think that most of us who saw that, the I felt like they buried the lead. Like, we're like, yeah, yeah it's great that you and did this, but like, if you if you looked at Twitter, like everyone was like, yeah, the, the new computers are fine, but they shot it on an iPhone. <laughs> like everyone was like, what? You know, and so so I think that, was that, kind was, of the, a shock. that was the big thing. It was, By the it way, it looks like this is an Ethernet connection. So it probably is SDI uh, in the still I have uh, here. Ethernet? Isn't that Ethernet? That's not fiber. Looks like yeah, a, that's an Ethernet connection. That's Ethernet. It's, yeah, but I don't know what that that Ethernet connection. Who knows is going what it's connected to? to. NAS is it? Yeah. A, What's a double know, like dragon? A, is that? Uh, I actually don't know. I don't <laughs> Maybe know that's the that name is. of the shot. I don't know. That's probably <laughs> the name of the kit that they built there. Oh, okay. Um, but this is yeah, video ingest. So they're they're probably but they they could be just pulling all those drives. So that Ethernet could be going to a NAS. Right. That is. That is pulling the oh, maybe know, they're that's pulling all the drives okay. from that, so yeah, that yeah. might be what what's happening there. Okay. But it's yeah. it's a lot of data either way. Um, but I do think that it's you know like I think when we look back at like movies like Tangerine, you know, is uh, you know that was the first movie that was made there, and a lot of us saw it coming. I mean, I think that if I think I, I reposted my Mac break where I did a the two G the three GS put it, I put it back on YouTube on my on my channel, but. Like we were excited about that 15 years ago. This is the, this is the camera that this is the this is the iPhone we all thought would happen in 2015. Looks, Looks like, like they're this. looping audio here. Is this is this a looping audio? Uh, they could be. I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, I mean they could def they definitely could be looping audio there. Yeah. Um, uh, to to get it just right. Right. It's very interesting. Which is often ADR yeah. is a pretty common uh, common thing to do. Because you have a lot of stuff going on in the in the scene when you're shooting it, so replacing it again right. is not that would, would be That's, pretty. Uh, the Apple VP hardware uh, is it Katie Bergeron, um, and I think she's in both those shots. So <laughs> it must be looping. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. It looks like it because I think she has headset a headset headset on, on, on the, the other second one. one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, it does, and they're not like the that. mic is not right in front of her, so they're trying to make it sound right. Like she's in a room, right? You're trying to get the same, same, the feeling. same resonance that you yeah. had before. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, fun to watch. It's uh it's a uh, in the uh, Apple uh, newsroom. If you want to look at it, Apple.com/slash/newsroom, you I, can watch the entire. And you know, I don't have they ever done a behind the scenes before. It's nice to see a behind the scenes of how they do they, these. They're starting to integrate them. So, like the Rodrigo movie, actually, um, the Rodrigo video was actually the commercial is made with the iPhone. Yeah, it's just showing you behind the scenes. Yeah, I love that. I think. Yeah. yeah. I think Apple could go a lot further. I mean, this here's just a steady this, cam. <laughs> Look at this. Here's a steady is, cam with an iPhone on it. <laughs> it's a it's a that's a DJI. I mean, it's not exactly a steady cam, but that's it's a, a um, it's a gimbal. It's a basically it's a gimbal head. Yeah, yeah. because the steady cam that is actually super hard to do on a steady cam because there's not enough weight. So you need ah, good point to balance, to balance the weight. Yeah, um, and. Steady and cam operators I, have all these counterweights sticking off of them. I, I got my brother. I had it. My brother's a steady cam operator, and he we put a little uh, Black Magic production studio. You know, like the little tiny. And he one. fell over in his face. He just had. It was so hard for him to balance that camera. <laughs> like it was just. It was. He's like, oh my gosh, we have to find a bigger camera. Like yeah. it's too small. It's too so tiny. The phone would be even. You need the accessory even brick harder. For that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you yeah, think exactly, they use DJI so. drones? They must have, huh? They did well. They I saw a DJI. The R two was in one of the shots. So I don't. They may have used the drone for that. Um, yeah. It won't be the drones that you think of. They're gonna the D, they have because uh, DJI, DJI has their has own cameras, so there are other drones. Yeah, it looked like yeah, a pretty big like a ass. R2. There it is. That's I think a that's big an R two right there. Yeah, that's the R two Ronin. I think. Oh, is that the, is that the drone? 
I think that's not. I think that's a just a that's a Ronan. I think just they showed on. it taking off, didn't they? Or maybe I'm wrong. I don't think I don't think that one is because oh, that's okay. a Ronin head. But but the yeah, I, I didn't see any of the drones taking off. But DJI makes larger drones that they probably use for this, so that they could because what they're those bigger ones are designed to do is put on custom cameras. You yeah. know, like you know, so they're 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 bigger. They're like octocopters. In a way, this is an even bigger flex. It's not just that they're doing it with the iPhone, but that they're letting you see how they do it. Uh, it's pretty. They could pretty they cool. could produce a two hour video yeah. about how they shot that with all the behind oh, the scenes, and I think so Apple great. should. I think yeah. they should they should teach people how to like. Here is how That's you a good do point. production with a phone. It's not just rap boasting; it's to show you how you do it. That's yeah. right. So I think that they hopefully they'll put more out. But when they do these, I really would love to see them do much bigger. It's really great. Of it. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just like to imagine that part, part of the PA, well, there, there's probably a whole PA on the job on the set whose entire job is to make sure the phone, there is actually a phone at the end of that enormous boom. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, wait, but, wait, but you, you did all those moves and the phone wasn't actually there. No, couldn't see it. Uh, we are going to see, we, we got, uh, we have this other Apple news. I don't really care about it, but there's other Apple news. <laughs> we got 17.1 since we met last. Um, which fixed a yep. bug, a long-standing bug in a privacy bug with the IP address um, and, and added some new features. 17.2 is going to add the journal and, uh, and some new beta stickers, which you didn't like so much. You give it a thumbs down, Jason. No, it's a it's it stinks. Uh, this is one of those things where they announced it in seven. It, it stinks uh, in seventeen. Uh, WWDC they said in seventeen this is coming, and the idea here is that, that for years they've had those six tap back icons, and every other messaging system in existence has let people react to uh, messages with emoji, and Apple's like, yeah, six tap backs is enough, and finally they're like, all right, fine. But what they didn't do is give you emoji. They gave you stickers and said, you can make an emoji a sticker. And then they built it using, I, I would say, like, it seems like the minimum effort required to do this feature, where <laughs> if you do the double tap feature, you don't get to see it. You have to tap and hold and then tap on sticker. And then... Uh, it's using a different sticker interface that's not the usual sticker interface not, or not the usual emoji interface. You can't search for an emoji. You have to find it. And when you send it, it sends it as a sticker and places it over the bubble you're reacting to, obscuring the text. Oh, Lord. So <laughs> it is. it feels very strongly like there was an internal debate at Apple and somebody finally just ordered the group responsible to do this feature. And they responded by saying, fine i'll give you your stupid feature and it is done in the it is just terrible it, this it, is they did the such malicious a bad job. compliance version of emoji I, it stickers. feels like that and yeah. so like the short the how do they fix this it's just a first beta so they've got a little time and i, I you know if i was begging them to do something first off when you double tap to do a tra tap back you should have the option to do a sticker right there and you don't second uh, they should make sure that the sticker doesn't cover the text that you're responding to so that people can't read the text. That's really bad. And then in the long run, you should probably show recent stickers that you sent in the tap back interface so you can get to them conveniently. And really what it should be is that those emoji or sticker reactions should appear like the tap back offset very nicely uh, because that is a well-designed interface. It just only has six things that you can use to express your feelings. And guess what? There are lots of emojis there are and people other like them. And people the have world. learned. And I've heard yes. from people who are like, well, why don't you just respond with it? And it's like, have you used Slack or Discord right. or Signal even? Like everybody lets you react with an emoji. It's a fun feature. People like it. And this feels like a feature that was implemented by people who hate it. They really like tap backs. They don't ever want to do anything but tap backs. And so, fine, here's your stupid stickers. And it's just, it's actually shocking how bad it is. And it feels like a feature from people who don't care and don't, and don't, and don't like it and don't want people to use it. And uh, I hope they fix it. I hope that the criticism that they've gotten from a few of us might shake something up inside because. It's just, it's bad. And this was the feature that I was maybe most excited about in iOS 17. Uh, I was like, finally, emoji tap backs. It's like, nope, it's stickers. And I'm like, okay, well, that might still be okay. Nope, it's not. It's bad uh, in multiple ways. So 17.2 also the brings the uh, announced yeah. but not uh, long-awaited journal app to, yeah. uh, to uh, iOS. 
And uh, yeah. it looks pretty simple, basic, right? What I do it's like, a, though, right? it's got an they API, wanna... which means day yeah. one, which is the exactly. better choice, will have all the capabilities of uh, the Apple Journal app, right? Right. So, so first off, it's great that Apple, like, Apple makes you know, makes things for the 90% of people who've never used a journal before, right? They're not trying to kill day one or anybody else. They're trying to maybe even be a gateway to something like day one, but something that has got basic features. But yeah, the way they built it is so good because we have talked about a lot on this show, Apple's tendency to launch a thing and it only works with Apple stuff, right? Like, and you're like, hey, wait a second, Apple, play fair. This is a great example of them playing fair. They built this journal app, but the way that it works it's got suggestions based on things that are going on on your iPhone, music you've listened to, people you're hanging out with, phone calls you've made, photos you've taken. All of that is in this activity uh, API. You have to turn it on. Um, and then when you add it to the app, it asks you, it, it like slides up a sheet basically and lets you pick what activity you want to add to the journal. The journal app doesn't see any of the activities that are suggested. Only when you choose to add it, like adding a photo nice. somewhere, does that app get it. And because they built it that way, not only does Apple's app not see it, third parties can use this feature. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. It's, it's private until you choose to share it with a specific app. And uh, using some of the existing APIs, apps can contribute to the uh the the activities as well so if you're like you're using call kit to do a phone call on skype or something it will show up as nice. in your list of uh of calls that you've made so they i think they're playing fair with this app in a way that uh, maybe we haven't seen in a while and i think it's a good sign the way they pitched it was uh you know it turns out it's good for your mental health if you uh journal and uh, you could keep track of how you feel on any given day. And we're going to make a simple way to do that. I just love it that there's an API. I didn't realize there was an API in as well as an API out. So that's really well, cool. It it's using existing APIs and I, I'm skeptical. Like, I don't think your Spotify music is going to track and it really should, oh. right? Like anybody, yeah. but, but like call kits an example. So some of these, like if you use these generic kind of like uh, kit interfaces that they use, all of that rolls in, but I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure that like everything is rolling uh, in there. Okay. Uh, anything else before we uh, take our final break that uh, is worth mentioning? I mean, we're we're excited. Did you, did uh, Alex? Did you order a new MacBook or a new iMac? No, I have to admit, I probably would, but I'm saving money for the Vision Pro. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, <laughs> That's I'm a wise, getting one, a and I was thing. like, oh, I gotta, I gotta save my ducats, and so I'm, I'm putting the money away because I have a feeling that it's not going to be thirty five hundred when I'm done with it. Like yeah. I have a feeling that I'm going to get like a couple extra things, and before I know it, it'll be five grand and. And so I'm I'm kind of holding off and I don't really need a new laptop. Like yeah. I still, I have an old one. I have an Intel. Apple hasn't broken the the wall yet. I just only, I have to charge it every time I'm like going to LA or going to something. I just never use the laptop. So I don't really, I'm not, I don't need it. I've got lots of Mac, Mac minis. <laughs> so I'm good. How about you, uh, Andy? I, I'm figuring you probably didn't order a Space Black macbook max no uh, now but now it's got me thinking oh now i can't buy a mac mini until they get the m3 oh the mac see, that's a disadvantage so like, yeah that, 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 I've, I've had this money like taped to the underside of my desk like figuratively speaking for five years now and every four months there's another reason for me not to pull the trigger on it but right now it's like oh i think i want a really good m3 mac mini at this point that would be that would satisfy my hunger extremely well Mr. Snell, did you bring anything back from New York other than banana chips? No, nothing. Nothing. No I'm not, loaner? Uh, I'm, I'm a MacBook. Pro. No, they didn't give us anything, which is good because then you have to find a way to get it back home. Mm. And an iMac is not going to fit in the overhead. Right. So. Can, uh, can I ask a semi-serious question? What were the snacks like at the at the condo? <laughs> like, what, what what kind of amenity? I've I've been to I've I've been to I've been to briefings where like they just take a hotel suite like for a couple of days. But like this is this is this is I assume is at like the Apple owned condo. Like I'm kind of wondering what the amenities are like when they have an event there. Honestly, I was offered uh, like coffee or tea or something, but I had already had my breakfast, so I didn't even look at the table. Sorry, <laughs> okay. I shirked. I shirked. You know, you got you had one job. <laughs> I know. Uh, I, unlike you fellas, did in fact just spend a ridiculous amount of money because I care about you, our audience, to get a <laughs> space black MacBook Pro with a Max in it. Uh, we will get it next Tuesday. 
So that's one of the nice things about this. They are shipping them right away. You could order immediately after the event, and uh, they're shipping right away. And I uh, yeah. got 64 gigs of RAM, and I got... Because Lisa has an M2 Max with 64 gigs of RAM, and I have to benchmark. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. I have to benchmark them. Uh, anyway, we'll have that uh, probably not for the show next Tuesday, but if I do, I'll I'll, I'll whip it out and uh, yeah. we will do uh, yeah. we'll run some numbers on this thing because I think it's really going to you know honestly even with eleven times the performance ninety percent of what you do the computer's faster than you anyway yeah. For, for, for a couple of decades now, basically this, a speed performance boost means that, wow, now it's doing a whole bunch of other things waiting. Basically now when it up, when it flashes the cursor waiting for me to type the next key, yeah. it's actually doing a whole lot more of nothing. And Alex is going to yell at me because he said you should get, he said, Leo, why would you get the 14? Well, because I want it to be portable. Ooh. I would like to have, but so basically I have a rocket ship in my pocket is the idea. <laughs> or in my That's hat. Small. There's enough you can't room work on it. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, I mean, I just, unless you're very small hands, it's just so tiny. It's like tiny. I like little, a like, smaller. I like a smaller. Sure. Uh, I just find. I think that part of the reason I don't need a new laptop is because I have a 14. <laughs> because yeah, yeah. I just. Oh, I don't need like. It. I just don't. Need I hate it. it. This so is. I, just, a, I didn't I'm just buy like, it. I need it. No I'm, I'm like, oh. like now, the idea what that I'm actually curious about is how Windows runs on and on parallels, for instance. Uh, and, uh, yeah. especially since uh, Windows on ARM is really held back by the current generation Qualcomm chips. But here comes NVIDIA and AMD and Qualcomm with better desktop class ARM processors. Be very interesting. Right now, the best processing for Windows on ARM is an Apple Silicon chip, and I suspect it's going to be <laughs> that way for some time to come. Right. So that'll yeah. be another thing I'll try. And then, okay, Baldur's Gate, you know, got to play Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, <laughs> they showed it. Yeah, uh, that's a, that's what made it interesting that they updated the uh, the twenty four inch iMac because now if it okay now I get that the idea that this could be like a gaming machine for the kids, like in the in the rec room. Yeah, if the games come out for it, but I think yeah, they're exactly. really making a strong argument for the for the GPU on this thing. All right, I think we've talked enough. Uh, let's take a break and come back. And you still have. A job to do, my friends. The picks of the week are coming up next as we continue with Mac Break Weekly. But first, a word from ZipRecruiter. We love these guys because I'll tell you what, if people move on. When you have an opening at your work or maybe you want to hire to expand, uh, it's hard. It's really hard. ZipRecruiter makes it easy. There are a lot of people we thank for making this show happen. For instance, Anthony Nielsen, thank you for all those stills from the Apple video. Uh, thanks to John Ashley. He's running the board, then edits the show, produces the show. Jammer B, who keeps the studio running. You know, these people are twit. Your employees are the company. It takes a team of people to make this show work. It takes a solid team to make any business successful. So if you're hiring, it's important you hire the best people. How you do it? Well, this is how we do it. ZipRecruiter. Right now, you could try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash MacBreak. You'll be so glad you did. ZipRecruiter's matching technology scans thousands of resumes to find the most qualified people for your job. And then it sends you... The match notifications so you can see the most qualified people and then it's up to you if you want them to invite them and by the way when you invite somebody to apply they apply they're thrilled and that gets you ahead of the line because you know what the best employees you're not the only one in the market uh, there's some competition this gives you a little head start send a personal invite to the top candidates they're much more likely to be interested in what you have to offer see we just love it we just love it. See why so many business owners and hiring managers are grateful for ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. And I would be very grateful personally if you try it yourself. Go to ZipRecruiter for free right now at ZipRecruiter.com slash MacBreak. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash M-A-C-B-R-E-A-K. ZipRecruiter. We love it. And I think you will too. So give it a try. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. We thank him so much 
for supporting Mac Break Weekly. Uh, Mr. Jason Snell, did you have a pick this week? I, I do, believe it or not. I, I managed to figure one out. Uh, the I'm going to pick the Eufy uh, C120 camera, uh, which I bought a couple of, and it's about it's, $40 it's on cheap. Amazon. It's cheap. Uh, I got it for 28 or what? something. Like They go on sale. It's a 2K indoor webcam, so powered. You can use their service. but It's not, it's not a webcam. Is, it's a security camera. Or Sorry, it's a security camera. Yes, yeah. it's a home, home live camera. We used to call all cameras on the internet webcams, by the yes. way, because that's web <laughs> yes. cam. Is, but yeah. you're right. Home security camera uh, does up to 2K resolution. The things I like about it, one, it's got an SD card slot, so you can have it record just to the SD card if you want to. Two, it'll work with your home uh, like uh, home server. So it'll just write to your home server's hard drive if you want, uh, which is very convenient because then you're not paying a cloud fee and you've got it locally and you've got as much as you want. You can use Eufy's service if you want to, but they support HomeKit secure video. So if you're an iCloud Plus subscriber, if you've got the Apple One bundle, you have a certain number of cameras, I forget what the exact number is, that'll do you know, 24 seven recording encrypted to Apple's servers uh, so that only you can see it. And you might trust Apple maybe better for that than Eufy. And you may also trust Apple and have already paid for this feature that you're not using. And so like to get for, like I said, I found it on sale for like t less than 30 bucks, a uh, an HD uh, home security camera to watch my dog when we leave her to see what she's doing. Which is <laughs> some bad stuff, let me tell you. Uh, she jumped up on the dining room table who knew? Uh, now I know. So anyway, uh, yeah, like if you're looking for an indoor camera to put somewhere, um, I, I I didn't do a comprehensive comparison, but I did find this camera and it's cheap and it works with HomeKit Secure Video, which for me is super convenient because then I'm not paying for another subscription and it's already part of my Apple One, but I could also save it to my server at home or just use it on an SD card. Very nice. Very nice. E-U-F-Y. This is the Anchor brand's uh, it's cameras. Anchors, yeah. 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 And I, somebody mentioned uh, to me when I mentioned that I had these, uh, that they had a, like a thing where they weren't uh, encrypting everything they said they were, and they did a software update, and they are now. But uh, my response to that person was basically, yes, but home se HomeKit Secure Video is, is secure. HomeKit Secure Video. You flip it over, and then you're not yeah. using their stuff anymore at all. You're just connecting to Apple and well, HomeKit. It's two, two good things, because yes, it's HomeKit. And and yes, Eufy has over the air updates, uh, yes. and is and is paying enough attention to fix it when there's a problem. So, right, I, I appreciate that on both. And a, boy, the price is right. Yeah, I, I didn't believe it when I saw it. I yeah. was like, okay, I'll buy two. Why not buy two? You know, I, I think you can thank Wise for for really putting the screws to all of these companies and saying, you know, you really can do yeah. it a lot less. Eufy dot com, the indoor cam C one twenty. Andy Anako, your pick of the week. Uh, I've been, as you might have told, so, so, be able to tell by my intellectual level, my energy level, and my voice. I've been sick for the past two or three days, so I just not not the big not the big one. It's just you know, a kid kidding sitting, sitting behind me on a commuter rail train was coughing a lot, and I caught it. Uh, so I don't have a software or hardware, but I did. It's always a good chance to talk about a. Uh, it's a great pumpkin, Charlie Brown on Apple TV Plus. Yes, they're horrible. Yes, they're fascist. Yes, they're committing crime against our cultural heritage by taking this beloved holiday classic and putting it behind a merciless late stage capitalistic paywall. However, some of us do up uh, do subscribe to Apple TV Plus, and so therefore, right, what may as well watch it as uh, on uh, Alex Lindsay approved streaming quality uh, and on 5K <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. The other the other thing oh the other thing <clears throat> is that uh, you've heard me recommend uh, Joyce Tidonato's uh, mass opera master classes uh, before. She is one of my probably one of my five favorite like performers in opera today. But one of the things she is amazingly talented at is doing these like one-on-one -on -one master classes. She does them like every year at Carnegie Hall while she's she's usually booked at the, the Metropolitan Opera like in October. So right when her run ends, she does like two or three days of these master classes with four or five different students. Each one, uh, each day's worth of video lasts about two hours. And it's an amazing thing to have like in the background while you're working. And I guarantee you that at least two or three or four times an hour, something you'll hear will like captivate you because it starts off with a, they, they sing an aria that you probably 
probably never heard before this. Oh my God, one of the most beautiful things you've ever heard. And like, my God, that's beautiful. It's perfect. And she's not tearing people down saying, yeah, that's not how you do things. This is not how we do things in the opera. It's more like walking them through, not just the technical stuff, but also the emotional stuff and the performance stuff of here's why this composer put this note right here and why you really have to stop here and give it that kind of attention. So if you've not, it's people often ask me like, Hey, I want to get, I want to get into opera. How do I do it? It's not really go out and see an opera, although that's really great. I think that if you watch a couple of these master classes, you will start to understand exactly how beautiful the music is and exactly how difficult it is and how much work goes into not just the technical stuff of somehow making a human voice produce these noises, but also all the thought that goes into every single note and every single measure. It really is one of the most creatively inspiring things as, as a, as a writer, like there are times where I'm like, ah, oh, I don't have it today or I don't want to do it today, or I'm just bored with my work. Oftentimes I'll spool up one of her master classes from this year previous years and it just gets into you know what creativity is never a solved problem you did it great this time uh, th- this time last week that doesn't mean that great all I have to do is repeat that every single time nope every single time you have to solve the you should solve the problem again or else why are you trying to be a creative person so it's just really really great stuff so high recommendation so yeah i mean you is it true that you want to sing uh baritone at the uh metropolitan opera next year this is not for people uh, who want to become opera singers. Necessarily. No, no, no. It's I guess it's not. Well, yeah. So the well, the master classes are like students from like people who are twenty years old and still like in their undergrad training to people who have been working like internationally for like a bunch of years now, uh, and it's a it's a competitive thing. That's it's not a, although I can't imagine exactly how badly things would be going at the Metropolitan Opera uh, that they would actually let me make noises other than applause and random hooting from the audience. Uh, although if they were to slip that up, then yes, I would definitely like they, if, if they left a side door unlocked. Yes, I would definitely take advantage of that opportunity. <laughs> Could you, I think you have a very nice voice. I'm, I'm, Oh my God. I, can, can, can I just, can I just say that you, th- you sing in the shower and you think that, you know what, this one, so, the, I, I sing the pirate King, like uh, a bunch of Gilbert and Sullivan. And I think that, you know what, I I'm pretty good at these two or three songs, but then you say, okay, by the way, this is a 4,000 seat theater. Uh-huh. There is no microphone. There is no amplification. They don't do any amplification even today. None. Wow. None. None. Not on any opera stage, really. Like the only time you see like uh, someone have a, a microphone is when they when they're streaming live in HD, and even then, that's not being amplified for the live performance. It's just being for the recording. So you imagine that not and not only are they filling a four thousand seat auditorium, they're singing above an orchestra. Okay. That's also like they out, they're outnumbered like 40 to one by this orchestra. And still they have to make every single note clean, perfect and precise to even people like me and the $40 cheap seats way, 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 way up top. I'm blown uh, away. I, you know, Broadway, yeah. of course, they have microphones hidden under their hair yeah. and uh, they have amplification. But I and, uh, and, and an no, opera and, and, was and, and, originally and, designed for an unamplified yeah. 19th century theaters. <laughs> but yeah. uh, I'm surprised they're still not doing any amplification yeah. i mean this is this is why this is amazing. why like these it takes it takes uh, I'll, I'll stop this rant but like one of the things that I, I love opera for the for the only reasons that matter is the most beautiful the most beautiful music and it provokes like an emotional response in me that no other form like routinely can do but i'm blown away by the fact that if you do 10 years worth of study Okay, you, they specifically started 16, 17, 18. They study for 10 years at their own expense. They travel for competitions, all this sort of stuff. At the end of the 10 years, you are kind of technically, you are technically capable of singing this song, the, these, the, these, these, these roles. However, now you probably have to go for another 10 years just to learn how to actually perform it. Like, okay, great, you can hit these notes. You, it's, you're on key and on tempo. You are singing it very, very pretty. But And this is something that uh, Joyce Sinanato says a lot like during these master classes it's not enough to just sing it pretty you have to be like you have to be able you have to be creating something every single time you have to be understanding what this character is doing in this moment why they're singing this why the composer decided to put this these notes right here at this time and what the emotional 
intention of this thing is there are times, I mean, there are times where like, uh, uh, again, I'm about to go off for another hour long tangent, but I just, I just really, really enjoy how much work goes into it. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with uh, the, the months amount of work that people in, uh, in musical, uh, musical theater and Broadway put into it. That's also an amazing amount of work that I'm incapable of doing. But when you, th- one of the benefits of opera is that when you hear, uh, when you hear, uh, when Joyce Tidonato, she just completed her run in, uh, uh, in Dead Man Walking. Uh, and it's not that she gets booked for this one performance. She learns that she does the blocking. She sings it. She moves on. This is the fourth or fifth time she sung this role in 10 years. She debuted this role in New York at a different opera. Uh, and so you have these performers who spend 10 years thinking about and working on these roles. And by the time they hit that stage, they're not making anything up, so to speak. They are really in the moment. They're not just simply they're they're really really you're seeing the residue of a lot of work and a lot of thought and a lot of artists and a lot of artistry and a lot of creativity and it really comes across now you've inspired me can i wear we this outfit to the opera you know what? They, there is no dress code. Uh, I, I, I test. But in your I, case, they might want to find one. Exactly. They might. They might. They might institute one. I, I actually, I actually, like two, two seasons ago, I happened to be like in New York, and I was had tickets to see another one of my favorite sopranos. Like, and it was like Halloween weekend, and so I, I did attend in a Boba Fett costume. However, I, think I remember that, that, that if very I, if, well. If I've, estab- if I've that established a, that, that was a nice costume, though. I mean, it was fairly dressy. It was, it was, I paid $140 for these nice tickets. I didn't want to be thrown out <laughs> of a Boba Fett costume. It was a but subtle, very credible Boba Fett. It was a, it was, exactly. I, yes. I'm, I'm very proud of it. It was a very considered costume. Uh, <laughs> but yes. But I, again, I, I've, I've seen people in like baggy shorts and flip flops. And again, they're like, your money, your money is good here, sir. Thank you for, thank you for supporting the opera. <laughs> it's you, you will, they will be keeping you far away from the dress circle crowd. The people who are spending the $400 who are in this, uh, in the huge, huge gowns and huge, amazing Bianca, Bianca Lago or whatever good stuff. But yeah, nope, there's, there's no dress code. They might, they might, they might ask sir to remove the enormous hat unless you're sitting in the vet back row, yeah. which you, I think is not, you not, do, not you do wear your big hat, don't you? But you sit, you put it on I, your lap I, during the performance. Well, it's it's a special opera version of that hat where it collapses down and you see oh. it folds for under the seat. Oh, they actually uh, call those top hats opera hats for that reason. <laughs> that, that, exactly. That, that, that actually that well, there was a time when everyone wore those hats, and again, yeah. they had the colla- they invented the collapsible opera hat specifically so that like you could do something with it instead of while you're while you're saying there. I it's, always wanted one of those. One of the many technological contributions that opera has opera has made to science and industry <laughs> over the past. My two, uh, two, college years. roommate. Bill Keen had a uh, collapsible top hat, an opera hat, and he loved going on his wrist, and it would go pop, and would pop out. It, it is pretty cool. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would own one in a minute. I don't think he ever went to the opera in it, but uh, but he owned it, and that's, that's a pity. That's the main thing. Alex Lindsay, your pick of the week. I have this little thing that kind of looks like a pill here. And this is a uh, so what it has it's here is Dante. It's got it's got Ethernet on one side and USB-C on the other. And the reason that this is so interesting um, is uh, this is made by uh, uh, Audinate. And th- this is a Dante AVIO. Um, it's a two-channel USB-C IO adapter. But what it does is it allows you to take your Dante network and push it straight into your iPhone 15. <laughs> so so now, um, so, if, so basically you have, you know, you have your Ethernet um, and you have your USB-C. And this USB-C then goes into you know this this whole little little string here goes into the end of your into your 15 and now you're getting studio audio and the phone when you plug it in the phone just goes hey is this headphones and you go yeah yeah it's headphones <laughs> and, and 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 you go okay and and it just treats it like a headphone jack um now we used to do this the reason that we would use these is for things like if you really want to be on a phone call and you know blow everybody away, you know, like the, you can, <laughs> you can now have a studio mic um, and uh, and and push it straight into your phone. Um, if you're doing a show, so if you're using something like Twitter, you know, X, uh, whatever, or or Clubhouse or any kind of other thing that's audio only, some of these require you to use your phone. They will not let you use a studio uh, setup or whatever. Yeah. So, like for instance, if you're going to Instagram um, and you need to use the Instagram app. You can now have a full-on mixer, um, uh, uh, so you could have a, 
you know, a Neve board if you wanted to and, and I'll put the whole thing and just plumb it right into your phone and you would get that high quality uh, audio back into the phone. So it is a, um, you know, it's a great way. It's, it's not perfectly. Let me understand how this, uh, how this works. Which end goes into which thing? <laughs> yeah, so the the USB C goes into your phone. Your phone, okay. And then you put an and Ethernet is, jack and in. And it's seen by the phone as an audio device. It just looks like a headphone jack. It's like okay, okay. Got it. You know, just so the phone just thinks it's a headphone jack. But what it's doing is it's using Dante. Dante is a network audio over network audio over IP. So Dante means it in our in my world whole studios, events, everything also running on Dante. So you can have hundreds of channels moving around. You could, but but in this case. You would have it go into your professional mixer. Your mixer would then send it to Dante as a stereo track. Um, so you have you, you could have eighty channels going into your mixer, and then it you do all the mixing, and and then you just plumb it back out, and it goes into you know goes out of Dante over an Ethernet, just into your network, and then this is this is doesn't require to be PoE. I did notice that it does charge your phone while you're, while you're connecting to it, um, but it it is PoE, and it goes out into your um, you know it basically converts that audio over IP back into the USB-C as a headphone. Um, so you can now tie, again, if you're an artist who wants to play great music and have the power of your mixer, so you're not just using the iPhone's uh, audio input to play your music, or if you're someone who wants to, again, use a studio mic for whatever reason for a phone call, um, these are ways to get, we've used Bluetooth in the past. I have another one that's Bluetooth to, uh, that does the same thing. It shows up as a headphone jack, but it was a little, you know, it's Bluetooth. So every once in a while it didn't work. This is just a hard line straight into it to do that. And you can push it, of course, into a um, breakout. So you could have, you know, you know, again, this the phone now is becoming this entirely new thing. You know, you could have professional audio going in. You could have it capturing high quality video. Um, all of those things could all be tied back together. So it's it's a kind so of the Ethernet world. jack then goes into some form of Dante enabled audio network. It's just, an, it, yeah, just Dante over a network. Right. And for simple Dante, you can just literally start plugging what's, the devices in. What's the cheapest Dante kind of mixer or inject, I guess, an injector of some kind? Well, you can have, for instance, you can have, uh, you can put Dante Virtual's sound card onto your Mac. Oh, so, so you could do it from a so Mac. for 30 bucks. Oh. So now you can send your Mac video, your Mac audio into. Into your iPhone. Uh, into your iPhone. Yeah, so, and you could, you know, if you have audio going into your Mac, you like your voice, you could be mixing your voice with uh, anything else that's going on in your Mac. And, you know, all of those th things could be mixed down. Oh, that's interesting. Again, in, your, in your Mac. And and yeah. you could use software, something like, you know, um, uh, there's like, I think, Sound Deck, um, which is uh, um, another another thing there. So anyway, so it's a, there's a lot of different ways. Anything that takes Dante, which is a lot of things, can now just feed that video, that audio full quality back into your phone which is that is kind of really cool. interesting a lot of us have, a lot of us have tried to do this for a long time it's been yeah. you know getting good audio into it has been a thing so this uh, thing has so, is brand new it hasn't been around before it's no, no it's been around oh but new the USB C phone. interface to the phone has <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so the USB C we were doing this with our iPads and with lots of other things but the fact that you can do it to your phone is exciting and new interesting so, but it's, yeah, but the, yeah it's not new itself it's it's just now remember that many phone calls are seven bit sound so you might be sending very high quality <laughs> audio into well yeah nothing. i mean again yeah it's probably more more likely that you would use it for um, zoom or something like for zoom. for yeah. zoom or for yeah. other things that you might want to sound a little bit better right um i know that the i, I when i use the other one the bluetooth one that um that I was using before this because we didn't have USB-C. I got, I jumped into a clubhouse, you know, and I just, because it was just the easiest way for me to jump in. Right. I jumped into a clubhouse. I think they were talking about renewable energy or something like that. And I was just listening, do, 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 do. And then I was like, oh, I want to say something. And I, I asked a couple of questions and they, the first thing they said is, what are you doing with Why your do mic? You sound <laughs> so like, good. Because I had I had this mic. I had this mic, <laughs> and I was going, going into a phone. On? Like everybody else had their, rah, 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 you know, and, and um, you know, it's, it is a, uh, it's, you know, the, I always, you know, your audio and your video nowadays is, is your, your suit and tie, you know? So if you want to <laughs> look and look and sound a little bit better, you know, that's probably more important than 
yeah. what you wear at this point. It, it kind of gets back to what we we're talking about the, the the iPhone being used to to record uh, that event at, at Apple. Like it's amazing that this this phone is basically just a cartridge that you insert <laughs> into all kinds of other hardware because yeah. it's it's just a cartridge that contains a CPU, a uh, a a network interface, uh, a data bus, and a way of writing data to an external device. Yeah. And that it's okay, just unplug the unplug the cartridge, plug it into this amazing huge voltron robot at the well, at the because in the middle of it that's the it's just a tiny little phone i love and it the, fun, the funny thing is, is that it all came back to that that head that you saw at the beginning an older version of that is really where uh you know how all this happened because if you look at this camera the camera that you see out of focus here the 950 you can pull the optical block out of that 950 and the reason that that's important is that ilm asked sony they were like we need to be on we need it lighter so that we can put it on a motion control arm and so so and then that's why when you see all these little box cameras that all came because they were because sony figured out how to take the optical block out of the camera for effect shots did and they, then everyone was like that's all we need did, like did, why, why are we building the rest of this camera yeah go ahead i, I didn't even think of this but apple did, did they talk about how their audio worked on that uh, on the event no, it's probably it was just video. Separate. I'm sure they're not yeah, using I'm the sure iPhone. They, <laughs> for to, the audio. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty common for any of those show, shoots to record the audio separately anyway. Yeah. So that you would never, very rarely, would you plumb. They're going to anyway. use some sound designs device, mm -hmm. and then they just and, and editing, and they'll just pair it up. Yeah, yeah. And then you you sometimes pipe it back in, or you use uh, you just let the mics capture whatever they're going to capture, so you can use right. it to resync. But that's also when they talk about the tentacle sync, that gives it time code, so that allows ah. you to sync it back to the. The tentacle sync would ah. let you sync it back to the audio records that you had on Perfect. your uh, Scorpio. Because Scorpio it reads uh, a time code. It, or generates the tentacle. it. Yeah. Or generates it. Could, it. It, could, it would probably, you probably uh, jam the, the tentacle to the Scorpio. Yeah. Gosh, there's a sentence I didn't think I'd be hearing anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you, Alex Lindsay. You know, you like this kind of stuff? That This really floats your boat. You should go to officehours.global every single day. Every single day, there's something exciting. They probably have said, jam your tentacle into your Scorpio more than once. <laughs> well, you know, they... <laughs> Show title. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, the, uh, tomorrow, we're going to actually be doing a lab, and it's probably the most complex audio on a Mac that I've ever seen. So um, Chris Fenwick, who uh, is, is regularly on our panel, uh, there's a video on our YouTube channel where he explains the pipeline that he uses to control using SoundDesk and Loopback wow. and oh, and all man. these other things. And he built this like 10 minute video. And what we decided to do is put the 10 minute video out and you should go watch it. And then we're going to just have a lab where we just kind of hang out and talk about is that it on your YouTube channel. Hour. It's on the YouTube channel right now. It's featured. So it should be really near okay. the top. And uh, but if you just look for the. Uh, you know, the sound desk uh, loop back. Um, I don't know. I can't remember what the title was that we put on it, but it's right at the very top. And um, but it is uh, incredible outline of how it all works. And so uh, I would highly recommend watching that video and then checking watching the live tomorrow because we're going to just we're experimenting with kind of a new format, which is kind of just these labs where we're not really trying to make it a show. We're just going to hang out and play with the hardware and software and talk about it and answer questions. So a little bit more informal. So we're going to be doing that in the, uh, um, the second half, the second hour. So um, I would highly recommend checking out that video. It's really cool. And then, um, and then come join us tomorrow. We're going to talk about the, uh, we're going to walk through it. He, he and I are going to, I have all the pieces that he has. So nice. Do it together and figure office it out. Office hours dot global. What's the YouTube, uh, cause there's another office, office hours. hours. Global. If you office, office hours global. Global is the key. Okay. Yeah. Because there's others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't. You know, it was only supposed to last. A I know. Weeks. Like, they told yeah. us it was going to be two weeks. Yeah, this was you know, for so, COVID. So, right. I know. Yeah. 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 So I was like, I was like, oh, there's a lot. And, and, and I didn't expect it to turn into anything. I was like, I'm doing office hours for uh, a couple months so that to help people do whatever they're going to do. I didn't expect all these cool people to show up and I didn't expect it's it pretty to, turn, amazing. to turn into something. Yeah. So it's, not, I would have picked a different name if I thought it was going to last. No, it's a great name. Are you kidding? It's a wonderful name. Yeah. Officehours.global, uh, both on the web and on the YouTube. Yep. Andy Anako, GBH. Uh, week after uh, week after next, uh, 1230, at the, 1230 Friday at the Boston Public Library. Go to See, WGBHnews.org to stream it uh, in audio. Go to J WGBH News channel on YouTube to see it. I always hate it when uh, Halloween falls on a show day because then I then this happens. <laughs> and uh, and so you're lucky well, I, you didn't have to go I, to the Boston Public Library dressed as a goon. 
I try. Well, I, I always do anyway. That's kind of my default setting. However, I, I, I did try to help you out here. I, I am wearing uh, a, one of my favorite cosplay pieces that if I if, if uh, I, uh, I, I put together another like Metropolitan Opera safe costume uh, that I wasn't able to use this year because I was I planned it in advance and it turned out there was nothing going on like Halloween weekend that a, I wanted to see, or B, it would have been appropriate to show up dressed uh, in a in a costume. But so I'm, I'm here. I'm helping you in spirit. You're kind of this, turning into Doctor Who before our very eyes. I might I might add. I'm you know I'm I'm very pleased. I was uh, <laughs> I was uh, the, the the best and probably the only compliment I've ever gotten about like how I dress was from someone at a comic con who like asked me who I was I was dressed up what I thought was nicely because I was interviewing like people like on stage uh, all weekend. And, and so, oh, what, what, what are you dressed as? Oh, this isn't a costume, just sort of dress. Oh, I'm sorry, you, you dressed like a time lord. And I'm saying <laughs> thank you very much. That is, that is that is codifying all of my fashion sense for the future. He dresses like a time lord. That will that's, do me fine. That's a take good that. aspirational uh, thing, I think. Yeah. Thank I you, Andrew. Thank you very much. I don't know if I, what I'm dressed like, but it ain't a time lord. It ain't a lord of anything. Mr. Uh, Jason <laughs> Snell is at sixcolors.com. He does so many shows. He is a Viking today, so but many. who knows what it'll be tomorrow. Go to uh, sixcolors.com slash Jason. To s any, anything in particular you'd like to mention this week? No, just stay tuned to sixcolors.com, right? That's, I got my big piece up there about the announcements from yesterday, and I'm sure, you know, there'll be ramifications it's a good piece. That going forward. Uh, it really informed actually everything we did today because I, uh, when I read that, I said, Jason's, not only Jason well, has nailed it, he also had his hands on it. So uh, uh, I got my fingerprints on yeah. it a little bit. Yeah. So this bit. is this is a absolutely must read uh, piece. Sixcolors.com. Thank you, Jason, Andy, Thank you, Leo. Alex. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, we do this show uh, every Tuesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800. Well, never mind. Forget I said 1800 because it's not. It's going to be. Oh, God, I should have done the math ahead of time. We're going, we're Sunday, we go back to a standard time. And that means because GMT, UTC does not change, we're falling back. So we'll be UTC minus eight. So 1900 UTC. I don't know. You figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's so complicated. 11 a.m. Pacific. That's the benchmark, right? You yes. figure it out from there. Uh, and zone. you can watch. The only reason I mention that, you don't have to watch this live, but you can at live.twit.tv. There's audio and video there if you're watching live to join us live in our Club Twit Discord. You can talk about the day's events. Club Twit is how we are funding a lot of what we're doing. And frankly, uh, towards the end of the year, I have a feeling we're going to have a little bit of a, I don't know, a come to Jesus moment because uh, ad, ad sales have really uh, dwindled, not just for us, but for all podcasts. I don't know if it's because there's so many podcasts or because advertisers have decided that uh, YouTube influencers are a better deal. I don't know what's going on. But as a result, uh, we are turning to you, our audience, for more and more of our funding. Now, the good news is it's not expensive. Seven bucks a month, $84 a year. There are family plans and corporate plans. You get ad-free versions of every show, which is nice, plus shows we don't put out anywhere else, like Hands on Macintosh with Micah Sargent, Hands on Windows with Paul Therott, The Untitled Linux Show with Jonathan Bennett, The Giz Viz with Dick D. Bartolo, Scott Wilkinson's Home Theater Geeks. Those are all paid for by club members. Uh, thank you, club members. And then the Discord is just a little icing on the cake, a wonderful place to hang. Uh, we thank you for uh, joining. If you can afford it, we appreciate it at twit.tv slash club twit. Now, on-demand versions of the shows, ad supported, are still available for free at twit.tv slash mbw. And you can still subscribe in your favorite podcast client. And there's still a YouTube channel. Even more ads if you're not, if you're not a YouTube premium subscriber. Uh, there is a Mac Break Weekly channel, so you can share little clips with friends and family and that kind of thing. In any event, we're glad you're here. We hope you'll be back next week. Unfortunately, it is my solemn duty at this point to tell you, get back to work. Because break time is over. Bye-bye. Oh, hey, that's a really nice iPhone you have there. You totally picked the right color. 
Hey, since you do use an iPhone and maybe use an iPad or an Apple Watch or an Apple TV, well, you should check out iOS Today. It's a show that I, Micah Sargent, and my co-host Rosemary Orchard host every Tuesday right here on the Twit Network. It covers all things iOS, tvOS, HomePod OS, Watch OS, iPad OS. It's all the OSs that Apple has on offer. And we love to give you tips and tricks about making the most of those devices, checking out great apps and services, and answering your tech questions. I hope you check it out.